All right. Is this working? Can y'all hear me? All right. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the 2018 National Black Law Journal Symposium. Um, I apologize for my voice. I'm a little under the weather, but I hope you can all understand me. Uh, I just wanted to uh, say thank you for coming to this event. This is the first time we've done this in quite a number of years, so we're incredibly excited to have you all here. Uh, as you know, our topic for this year is trumping our rights, recentering our advocacy in the age of 45. Uh, the goal is to take a look at the way the black community is going to be affected uh, given the new administration, the new policies that are being put into place, especially the new federal uh, judicial appointments. And uh, we have a number of amazing speakers here for you. Uh, we hope you all will gain a lot from it and that uh, through the Q&A, they'll gain a lot from you. So thank you again, and uh, I'll hand it off to our Can you hear me? Okay. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, I thought it would be best um, to just have a moment of silence for two immigrants that were killed last night, um, just before, or who died last night at a crash fleeing from immigration agents. Um, I thought we should just, just have a moment of silence for them. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. Um, welcome to the first panel discussion, uh, International Rights and Immigration. My name is Letlokho uh, Nolomokhogwane. I'm currently an LLM student uh, in the LLM program. And uh, like most LLMs and three hours in this class counting the weeks to graduation. Um, as you may be aware, I'm not an American citizen. And for the first time, this is a very good thing. I'm from the wonderful country of Mandela, South Africa. As you may be aware, the current president, Mr. Ramaphosa, um, has undertaken in parliament to start the process of expropriating agricultural land without compensation. This has been reported by Fox News as racist land grabbing. Some white farmers have approached the international world seeking asylum, claiming that there is a white genocide. Yes, you heard right, they're claiming a white genocide. And how has the international world responded? Well, two days ago, a top immigration, um, Australian immigration official said that white farmers from South Africa should be granted emergency visas, saying they needed protection in a civilized country amid the debate of land redistribution of land. Further, the official said that white farmers deserved special protection. He promised offering the farmers expedited visas to settle in Australia on humanitarian grounds. However, thousands of predominantly Muslim immigrants from the Middle East and Southeast Asia have languished in offshore detention facilities for years under a policy that detained asylum seekers traveling by boat entering into Australia. The official is a staunch defender of the offshore detention policy and has argued that Australia should not accept refugees who, have, uh, who would be a burden on the country's social uh, safety net. He has also blamed African immigrants for the rise in crime in Melbourne claiming in an interview that the residents in the cities were afraid to go to restaurants at night because they were followed home by thugs. In the United States, it is reported that over 12,000 people have signed a petition titled Genocide of Whites in South Africa, asking President Trump to let white people in South Africa immigrate to the US. The petition begs Trump to take necessary steps to initiate the emergency immigration plan allowing white Boers to come to the United States. Boer, means South Africans of Dutch, German, and Huguenot descent, who also are referred to as Afrikaners. The petition also claimed that Trump should not accept uh, refugees from Somalia and the Middle East, arguing they cannot be properly vetted. However, white people from South Africa can be easily vetted and also possess skills uh, that, make the uh, that make them compatible with the culture and civilization. These events reminded me of the words of author Toni Morrison, who wrote an essay in the New York Times a week before the 2016 election. The essay is entitled, Making America White Again. She begins her essay in this manner. This is a very serious project. All immigrants to the United States know 
and new that if they, become, if they want to become real authentic Americans, they must reduce their fealty to their native country and regard it as secondary, subordinate, in order to emphasize their whiteness. And like any nation in Europe, the United States hold whiteness as a unifying force. Here, for many people, the definition of Americanness is white. This brings us to the relevant issues uh, in the United States pertaining to immigrant rights and international rights. The Washington Post reported yesterday that immigration rights activists have yet again turned to court to try and alter immigration policies. They have filed three lawsuits against the Department of Homeland Security. The first suit demands deportation of officers to stop arresting undocumented immigrants at the courthouses. The second pertains to the detention of asylum seekers uh, while their cases are being heard. The third is to overturn Homeland Security's decision to end special humanitarian protection for some 500,000 <coughs> Haitians who will be undocumented immigrants in 2019 after their temporary protective status runs out. This in addition to dozens of other ongoing legal challenges such as the travel ban to individual deportations of Somalians, Haitians, uh, Indonesians and Africans. The sanctuary city policy attempts to revoke the darker deportation amnesty, treatments of undocumented immigrants in uh, detention, the uh, border wall and access to abortion of immigrant children. We all know that we all know President Trump's feelings towards immigrants in this country. Recently, he has said, why are we letting all these people from shithole countries come here? Today, I have the distinguished panel of moderating um, this uh, panel discussion on international rights and immigration rights. We're going to have um, 10 minutes from each speaker as opening remarks, and then we'll start having a conversation. Before I forget, I should introduce the panelists. Um, the first speaker that we're having is Professor Beidoun. Uh, he is uh, an expert uh, in a lot of Islamophobia and anti-blackness and a lot of uh, work that deals with immigration rights, particularly pertaining to the Muslim community. <coughs> then we have Professor um, Chacon. Um, she is at UC Irvine uh, and has done really excellent work um, in, in this field as well. And then we have Professor Achume from UCLA, um, who has also been named the UN Rapporteur for Racism and All Forms of Intolerance. So we'll give it over to Professor um, uh, Pedon, and then we'll start the conversation. Thank you. Good morning. Is this thing working? You guys can hear me? Good, okay. Good morning, salam alaikum. Thank you to the organizers for having me for this wonderful symposium. Um, it's great to come back to UCLA. I obviously went to school here and uh, taught here for a little bit, so it's always uh, a warm homecoming to come back. So what I want to do in my 10 minutes, I'm going to try to do a lot in 10 minutes. Hopefully I can get through it in 10 minutes, but address uh, Islamophobia theoretically, talk about how the war on terror intersects with anti-black racism. Uh, you know, clearly in this country, there's a tendency to think about Islamophobia um, as specifically and exclusively impacting uh, only Arab and South Asians because Muslim identity is understood and conflated with South Asian and Arab identity. Um, so I want to do four things. I know it's kind of ambitious, but we'll try to get to it in 10 minutes. I talk about Islamophobia from a theoretical standpoint. I spent some time writing a law review article which breaks down uh, what Islamophobia means from a legal standpoint which deviates away from how uh, it's understood and how it's framed in the popular sphere, but also within the academic sphere. I'm gonna talk really briefly about the Muslim ban. Uh, there's been three renditions, obviously, of the Muslim ban, but talk specifically about uh, the initial form and then the one that's obviously uh, standing now. I wanna shift and talk about surveillance, uh, and specifically a program called counter-radicalization programming, which became the signature war on terror program under the Obama administration. Uh, in a program that Trump has um, committed himself to expanding and intensifying. And then finally, I want to close with a brief discussion on this new designation being uh, extended by the FBI called Black Identity Extremism, which looks to crack down on a range of activism that uh, black organizers, specifically organizers and activists that are associated with the Black Lives Matter movement or offshoot um, organizations. Uh, are being vilified and uh, scrutinized almost in a war on terror context and frame. So what is Islamophobia? It's obviously a term that has captured a lot of resonance in recent years. Uh, it's a term that you know really rose to the fore, I would say, in 2011 when there was a lot of debate 
if you recall in New York around this Ground Zero mosque that was being proposed to be built near the site of uh, the 9-11 terror, uh, terror attacks. Uh, it also gained some steam in the discursive space with the rise of this uh, anti-Sharia legislation that was happening across the country. But it really proliferated and became a really common term uh, during the rise of Trump. You saw it being regurgitated. It became really prominent in news. It became really prominent in headlines. And then academics started citing it in law review articles uh, and literatures beyond the law. Now, the term, even though becoming popular and becoming widely used, was still flatly defined. It was framed in very one-dimensional terms. It was specifically framed as a kind of animus that was deviant and aberrational, right? It was, fr it was framed as an animus that was being inflicted or unleashed by private actors, private individuals, hate mongers, bigots, individuals who were viewed and kind of pegged to be on the margins of society, right? These individuals who were engaging in Islamophobia were not emblematic of mainstream society, and they certainly weren't emblematic of what the state was doing. There was also a lot of academic uh, and scholarly critique about the term. The term is not effective enough. It doesn't have uh, the kind of gravitas to you know, address or kind of uh, explain what is going on on the ground with regard to animus toward Muslims. So a lot of the prevailing definitions embodied, uh, you know, again, these narrow, flat um, meaning of the, meanings of the term. And I thought that it was you know, high time to kind of redefine the term to attempt to explain uh, the breadth and also the, the, the various disparate sources that give rise to Islamophobia. So I wrote this article in 2015 in the Columbia Law Review, uh, which redefined Islamophobia. And the definition that I proposed was that it is, Islamophobia is the presumption that Islam is inherently violent, alien, and inassimilable, driven by the belief that expressions of Muslim identity are correlative with a propensity for terrorism. That is the foundational definition that breaks down into three forms. First, you have private Islamophobia, second, structural Islamophobia, then the third form, uh, dialectical Islamophobia, which I'll talk about in a bit, which is this exchange, this discourse between uh, state and state action, and also the ideas uh, that are adopted by the polity. Okay, and again, one thing I talk about in this piece is that Islamophobia is not a novel phenomenon. It's not something that just came into being after the 9-11 terror attacks. It's deeply rooted and it's specifically tethered to this master discourse we, uh, some of us might know uh, about called Orientalism, right? This idea, this theory that was framed by the prominent Palestinian American intellectual Edward Said, uh, who, who discusses that the world was divided in this binary, right? European thinkers, scholars, tastemakers, artists, so forth and so on, uh, defined the, the Orient, and the Orient was synonymous with the Muslim world as being the mirror opposite, you know, the civilizational antithesis of the West, the Occident. So if the West was democratic, if the West was where liberalism flourished, if the West was where modernity was thriving, if the West was where uh, gender parity existed, the Orient, vis-a-vis -vis the Muslim world had to be everything but, right? The exact opposite of uh, the Occident, the West. And that's where we see these tropes about Islam being a violent faith, being a backwards faith, being a static faith, being a sexist faith, a warmongering faith, are entrenched, right, and produced and manufactured by Orientalism. Okay, I'm not going to get to all four things. <laughs> uh, but good, I can get to them in the Q&A, hopefully. Um, you know, these tropes and these stereotypes are rooted by Orientalism. And Letty Volpe, in an article she writes a year after 9-11, talks about how the 9-11 terror attacks led to the redeployment of Orientalist tropes, right? The moment in which Islamophobia becomes a thing is an extension of these Orientalist tropes. So again, getting back to Islamophobia in the three definitions, so Orientalism is the mother of Islamophobia, which becomes the modern form or the modern uh, instrument to go about vilifying and demonizing Islam and the followers of the faith. Three types, private Islamophobia, which is the type, the form, that is most commonly talked about by scholars uh, and media pundits. This is the animus that's inflicted or the violence inflicted by private individuals. We see it through the uptick on attacks on mosques, for instance. We see it uh, on, uh, through the attack of individuals who are conspicuous 
uh, or obvious Muslims. We see it through tragedies like the murder of the three Muslim students at UNC Chapel Hill. Right? This is private Islamophobia undertaken by private individuals or private actors. Second, we have structural Islamophobia, which is the Islamophobia that is unleashed by the state by way of policy, by way of law, uh, and police, policing programming. Things like the Patriot Act, things like counter-radicalization policing, things like the Muslim Registry, which was actually a policy that was uh, enacted by um, the Bush administration and extended by the Obama administration, policy called NSEERS, the National Security Entry and Exit Registration System. So when Trump talks about a Muslim uh, registry, ain't nothing new. It's been done, uh, was practiced, and was uh, part of policy in the previous decade. That is structural policy and really key because this is where the law, the policy, is actually adopting this foundational stereotype that ties Muslim, uh, Islam and Muslim identity to the propensity or possibility of terrorism. And then finally, we have dialectical Islamophobia, which is the relationship uh, you know, keying in on this relationship between state policy. So if the state is uh, effectively communicating to the polity that uh, Muslims are to be policed, prosecuted, and punished through counter-radicalization policing, the Patriot Act, or even presidential rhetoric, right? Presidential rhetoric is a form of structural Islamophobia. It's communicating to the polity that these stereotypes and tropes, these negative ideas and images you have about Islam and Muslims are legitimate. It endorses those ideas and those tropes. And then during times of crisis, times of crisis could be, um, let's say, an attack of some kind, whether it's committed by, committed by a nominal Muslim or a non-Muslim and so on, right? This, these policies, this presidential rhetoric actually emboldens violence and backlash against um, Muslims. And we saw that, obviously, during the presidential campaign when there was an uptick um, in attacks against Muslim institutions, um, uh, individuals, uh, visible Muslims, but also individuals who are perceived to be Muslims, right? Because again, through the private Islamophobic lens, uh, the Muslim caricature still exists. So perceived Muslims like Sikhs, like Hindu men and women, Latinos in some instances, right? They're profiled, they're racially profiled as Muslims, and oftentimes they're victim to the attack. Okay, I don't have much time, so uh, you know, God willing, I can get to the remainder of uh, the presentation during the Q&A. One thing I want to talk about and tie it into the, uh, the conversation, uh, the broader conversation at hand is uh, there's, there's strong neglect and stereotypical framing of Muslim identity as being almost exclusively Arab and South Asian. So during the Q&A, I want to explore how uh, Islamophobia and the war on terror policies that extend from Islamophobia have a disproportionate impact on black Muslims. Um, black Muslims uh, comprise, I would say, roughly 30 to a third uh, of the, the, the percentage of the, uh, the Muslim American population. Uh, and through programs like counter-radicalization policing, which is deployed uh, in cities uh, across the country, in cities like Minneapolis, where the majority of the Muslim Americans in Minneapolis are Somali, we see how counter-radicalization has an acute and disparate impact. Uh, I also want to talk about how a black identity extremism, this new designation, intersects with counter-radicalization to have a compounded impact on black Muslims who are organizing uh, against war on terror policy, but also organizing against uh, police violence, uh, racist police, ta police tactics, and so forth. And hopefully during the Q&A, bridge the conversation. I just want to lay out the theoretical foundation so we understand Islamophobia um, and the kind of thinking that fuels the war on terror policies and programs that have this impact on a whole range of Muslim communities. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we're just going to um, set up the second PowerPoint That's and then. Fine. And I can start. Okay. okay. Yeah, I have, I have some bad slides um, <laughs> that are very text heavy and visually appealing. Um, but I want to go ahead and get started uh, because uh, I can at least lay the foundation and keep us going. Um, I wanted to just emphasize two themes in my remarks. And the first is um, that I'm really just delighted that this is the kickoff panel for this conference because I think it really kind of showcases the importance of thinking about the international, thinking about international rights and the intersection and interplay of the international and the domestic. And particularly, I have the opportunity today to talk about the way that immigration restrictions and immigration policies 
are fueled by and fuel domestic racism, anti-blackness, and white nationalism. So we can think about the ways that these two um, kind of often separate conversations um, can and should come together and need to come together in how we think about and animate the rest of the conversations today. And the second theme that I wanted to emphasize in my remark is that this conversation is not and should not be all about Trump or the Trump administration, and I think the prior remarks really highlighted that very nicely, um, and, and I think no one on the panel is going to disagree with this, but I just want to make sure that we keep that framing capacious. I think only the most smug and the most privileged can really think um, that Trump is anomalous uh, in, in, you know, in, in, in being racist, um, or that his regime has taken us to a new low. I think the openness of white nationalism um, and the shamelessness of the racism are throwbacks to a few decades ago, but they're not new, right? There's, there's a way in which we're sort of, we feel like we're moving back in time in some ways, but we are moving on familiar ground. Um, and many of the underlying policies uh, that the Trump administration has built upon, exploited, um, and in some ways uh, mastered um, have long bipartisan roots, um, deep roots. Um, and so we need to get beyond just discussing uh, or demonizing a single administration, and we need to think about the deep roots of these problems and make sure that we're examining uh, the, the, the histories um, and, and the depth of the problem. And so to illustrate this point, I wanted to start my conversation today at a sort of perhaps uh, counterintuitive point, and that is to tell the story of Adrian Moncrief. And some of you probably know this story. Those of you who study immigration probably do. But Moncrief um, was a Jamaican citizen, black Jamaican citizen, who came to the United States. Uh, he came uh, in 1984. He was three years old. He entered with a visa. Um, and in 2007, so you can see many years after his entry, while he was still a lawful permanent resident, he was stopped while driving on a Georgia highway. The officer justified this stop in ways that will sound familiar. Um, it was justified on the ground that the windows were excessively tinted, but no citation for excessive tinting of windows ever issued. Um, and Kevin Johnson has written an article where he looks at the case file, um, the, the police report in this case, and the record reeks of a, what looks like a pretextual stop, a, a classic driving while black scenario. Um, so he stopped, um, and the, during the police stop, the police find 1.3 grams of marijuana in his car, um, which is the equivalent, equivalent of about two or three marijuana cigarettes. Um, and Moncrief uh, then pleaded guilty to the possession of marijuana with intent to distribute under Georgia law. <coughs> so we have this classic example of uh, over-policing and racial profiling <coughs> leading to a drug conviction. This is a familiar song and one that we will hear about when we talk about criminal justice policies. Um, but because we're dealing with an immigrant in this case, it also takes a new and exciting turn. Um, the Department of Homeland Security decides that he should be deported as an aggravated felon. And they pursue this claim through the Obama administration, right? So it's Obama administration officials arguing this position before the Supreme Court ultimately that his conviction is an aggravated felony, which would result in his immediate removal, a permanent bar, uh, a bar to virtually any form of relief that might be possible under immigration law. This is for a person who's been a resident in the United States for 30 years and has been here since childhood. Uh, so that's, that's the Obama administration's argument, right? That this is a dangerous, aggravated felon who needs to be removed without possibility of relief. The Obama administration actually loses that argument uh, before the Supreme Court, but it's important to note that the drug crime still makes Moncrief and others like him deportable. Any drug crime uh, puts you into the ground, with, with very minor exceptions, uh, puts you into the, the territory where you are deportable. It becomes discretionary if it's not an aggravated felon, but it still uh, potentially carries harsh immigration consequences. And since you're not entitled to representation in immigration proceedings, you can imagine that for a lot of people, um, this sort of scenario uh, has some dangerous um, implications. And I think this interplay between the racially biased criminal enforcement system on the one hand uh, and the hyper-aggressive deportation system uh, on the other helps to explain why we have seen these patterns of what Tanya Golesh-Boza has called a racialized and gendered uh, immigration enforcement regime where men of color, black and Latinx men, are heavily overrepresented in removal proceedings in proportion to, in, in, in comparison to their proportion uh, in the immigrant population. Um, the Obama era focus on a group he called criminal aliens um, has helped to explain in part how this has happened. Um, what's interesting to, to note is when President Obama did his sort of post-mortem on the criminal justice system in his Harvard Law Review article, um, where he criticized many of the trends of racialization over criminalization, the word immigration does not appear 
once. Um, and you can see this linkage between racist policing and the immigration system that relies on racially biased criminal enforcement systems is completely lost in, in that translation. But if it was lost on the Obama administration, it has not been lost on the Trump administration. Um, Trump has appointed a fair number of incompetent cabinet members and administrators. We can list them. But in a couple of areas, his appointments have been very talented. Um, and I think one uh, we all should acknowledge is uh, the appointment of Jeff Sessions to the Department of Justice. If anybody ever understood the interplay between the criminal justice system and the immigration system, it is Sessions and his people. They know how it works. They know how to maximize uh, the impact of those, the interplay between those policies. And they have made that a priority of the administration. Um, so when we look back at the early Obama administration, we see an administration that sort of struggled with what to do with immigration policy and how uh, to understand this interplay. And only late in the second term um, do we see some sort of learning process whereby they said, oh, well, maybe this we should you know, have more, uh, more discretion, the Secure Communities Program, which is funneling um, people straight from arrest into the deportation system, we should uh, step back on. So there was a learning process. Uh, Sessions hit the ground running, um, <laughs> kind of bringing all of these um, sort of toxic interplays uh, back and to the fore. And the same was true for appointments in DHS, including John Kelly and now Nielsen, um, who understand at a very deep level the way that these two systems can be used uh, together to achieve certain objectives. And what they understand is that the exclusionary regime of immigration law um, and the exclusionary regime of criminal enforcement together are mutually reinforcing, and they can be wielded together to create a national preoccupation with non-white criminal invaders and security threats. And that's what they have done. Um, so, in the slides, I have um, just a couple of uh, kind of examples for thinking about this, perhaps. Um, so the first is, uh, let's see, um, just thinking about sort of the use of the immigration system and the criminal justice system together as a mechanism for um, making criminals out of immigrants. Um, and, and so we can see um, when uh, Sessions came into power, uh, one of his immediate priorities was to ensure that every single uh, uh, AUSA, uh, regardless of their own individual priorities, was prioritizing immigration as a site of criminalization. Um, so just ramping that up, right, saying you will and you should be pursuing illegal entry prosecutions, um, misdemeanor reentry, alien smuggling, et cetera. Those should be and need to be priorities of every single uh, district in the country, and I want to see how you're going to prioritize that. So we see that sort of deliberate um, prioritization. We also see um, the sort of um, use of uh, uh, these uh, kind of prosecutions on steroids, so really focusing on people who are crossing illegally and using, or crossing without authorization at the southern border and using the criminal justice system, not just to, uh, so you're not just removing people or putting removal orders on their records, you are actually prosecuting them as well. Um, and it's interesting because uh, the um, Office of the Inspector General did a study of the Streamline Program under the Obama administration, and what they found, as you'll see in the slide, um, is that there's a real risk um, when you are using this heavily criminalized system of immigration enforcement at the border, um, that you are returning uh, legitimate asylum seekers, other people with valid claims for immigration relief, um, and that you're not only returning them, you're also criminalizing and then returning them, that thereby making any uh, future interaction with the immigration system incredibly fraught. And so uh, they said, we actually think you're probably violating international law through the use of this streamlined program. Um, and uh, obviously, it persisted. Um, and the Trump administration has proceeded to amplify the use of these kinds of programs without regard to the potential international law implications. So that's kind of a second uh, strand. Um, I think the third strand, uh, this is a strand that gets lost often in the discussions around the travel ban, but in the same uh, time period when the January travel ban was announced, the Trump administration also announced that they would ramp up the use of something called expedited removal, which is essentially a highly streamlined process for determining whether individuals ought to be deported uh, or not, or removed or excluded at the border or not. Um, and, and they said, we want to expand the category of people to whom this could potentially apply, and we want to use it um, more aggressively. Um, and so here again, you see the potential risks for individuals who have valid rights under international law or under domestic law um, who might be able to raise valid claims if only they were represented in an actual proceeding where there was a real judge. Um, but in fact, they're not having any of those opportunities um, to access those rights. Um, and so that's another uh, real site where um, we see kind of by presenting all potential 
immigrants as dangerous invaders, dangerous other invaders, we see the sort of truncating of access to rights. The final example I want to use, because I'm out of time, is a kind of gang warfare, right, in which Jeff Sessions is engaging quite enthusiastically. So these are some remarks that, actually, I don't think he delivered all of these remarks. Maybe he thought better of it. But they were posted on the Department of Justice website as he made this visit to the Border Patrol on April 11, 2017. And you can see from the rhetoric here, he talks about taking a stand against the filth that is MS-13. So characterizing essentially every border crosser as a machete-wielding maniac who is coming to disrupt the country. And this anti-gang rhetoric, which has been quite common and quite commonly deployed by this administration, has been a driving force behind their justification for a lot of the immigration policies. And I think this matters not just to individuals who may or may not be actually affiliated with MS-13, but to anybody who is kind of believed to be a gang member, ascribed to gang membership in our kind of vastly over-ascriptive gang labeling process, anyone who might have some sort of tangential affiliation with anybody who is a gang member. And I don't think it's limited either to Latinos or Central American or Latino immigrants either. There was an article in the New York Times on March 2 discussing the fact that Sessions has prioritized MS-13, is putting lots of money into the removal of MS-13, and that one of the consequences of this is departments, sheriff's departments, et cetera, are taking this money, and then they're sort of fudging their reports on who they're using this for. And the example that was used in the article was that a department in New York had characterized some of their arrests as MS-13 arrests, when in fact it was what they characterized as a Dominican gang. And so we can see the ways that this heightened rhetoric around immigration, the need to target certain quote-unquote immigrant gang members, actually just means more intensive policing of communities of color, poor communities of color, where gang ascription runs rampant. And so it's not limited to a narrow slice of life. It is, in fact, something that has the potential to impact on numerous communities and is impacting numerous communities. So I think it's really important to think about how this will impact black communities, poor black communities, poor men are identified as gang members, as well as thinking about this as an immigration phenomenon or immigration problem. So I'll stop there. There's more. The list goes on. All right. So I want to start off by thanking the National Black Law Journal and, and really just want to underscore how much I appreciate um, and feel fortunate to be a faculty member in an intellectual environment such as the one you are aiding to build. So thank you so much for including me in this discussion. Also because I have dreamed of being on, being on a panel with these two um, people to my left and my dreams have come true um, because there's a lot of overlap in the things that we're discussing. And so um, thank you also for inviting them. Um, I too have more uh, in my presentation than I can get through in 10 minutes, in part because I think I received an email that said 20 minutes, not to be all loyally. Um, but I'm going to do my best to get through as much of, of this as I can. And so what I want to do first is to, uh, is to really put into a global context the assault on the human rights um, of migrants. And I think it's great that I'm going last because a lot of what the other panelists have discussed, I think, is just a microcosm for a much larger um, story. And then I also want to highlight some of the outrageous examples of this global um, assault, specifically um, on black bodies, emphasizing the structural dimensions in the international um, arena that mean we should be even more outraged about immigration law and policy than we are about racist and xenophobic tweets that I think very much mirror them. And this ties to some of the points that um, Jennifer just made. And then finally, if I have time, I want to reflect on the governing international human rights law and, and make some comments on the larger legal framework at the um, international level. So I'll start off with the global context of um, xenophobic exclusion. And, and 
I, I want to highlight what I mean by, I, by global. I mean to say that it's taking place all over the world, but don't want to ally the fact that it is actually contested racialized um, immigrant exclusion. So we're focusing um, on the negative, but there are many communities in the US and, and across the world that are actually pushing back against a lot of what we're um, describing. And it's important to note that, to celebrate that, and to theorize that um, as well. Um, I also want to talk a little bit about why I think a global perspective is, is vital. So at a very basic level, we should all care about racial subordination irrespective of its geographic location um, on this earth. But in addition to that, even just from the perspective of working through solutions for a national or a local level, it's definitely the case that some of the forces that are at work here domestically can only be understood by accounting for their supranational um, dimensions. And so I think even if all you care about is the national, the supranational is a, is a key piece of the explanatory um, uh, picture. So despite the sustained efforts of states across different parts of the world to keep refugees and involuntary migrants out, the levels of involuntary displacement that you see today um, are um, uh, unprecedented, and by involuntary displacement, I'm talking about uh, refugees, so people who cross international borders and are fleeing persecution. This is the definition of a refugee um, in international law, an abbreviated one, but also thinking about other categories of people that leave their homes because they're forced to move, either because of extreme human rights violations, climate change-related displacement. That, to that sort of migration is, it has reached um, an especially high level. So in 2015, we had the highest global displacement figures um, on record. In 2017, there were 22 million refugees um, globally, and this is people who are fleeing persecution across international borders. So I want to highlight two things about, about the refugee figures that I think are really important. So first, the vast majority of refugees are non-white and actually are coming from Muslim-majority um, countries. So 76% of the global uh, refugee population under UNHCR's mandate, and this is excluding um, Palestinian refugees who fall under um, a different mandate, are from the following 10 countries. Syria, Afghanistan, Somalia, South Sudan, the Democratic Republic of Congo, Central African Republic, Myanmar, um, Eritrea, and Colombia. So that's one fact is just thinking about where refugees are coming from. Another fact I want to highlight is that the conflicts in these countries are not internal to these countries. They involve the very strong intervention of global, global um, hegemons, including um, the United States. So even though the refugees are originating um, in the global south, even though they are predominantly non-white, and even though they're coming from majority Muslim countries, this is not a problem that is alien to anything that is happening anywhere in the first world. So that displacement is very much um, implicating countries that today want to act as though the problem is, is somebody else's problem. Um, I made a mistake. There's a third thing that I want to highlight in relation to these um, figures, which is that 86% of uh, refugees are in the global south. If you heard me speak yesterday, there's some things that I'm going to say again, but I don't think it's, it's bad to repeat statistics that are as um, important as this. If we think of 86% of refugees being in the global south, that means that the bulk of the responsibility of um, protecting refugees is actually being borne by countries in the global south, countries like Lebanon, countries like Kenya, countries that you don't um, read about as having the levels of xenophobic backlash as you see um, in the first world. So if you think about um, refugee figures for last year and the year that there were all of the, this wave to keep refugees out that I'm going to talk about um, in more detail, only 6% of refugees um, were actually seeking entry into the first world. So all of that backlash that was so heightened in this part of the world is completely disproportionate to where people are and, and where kind of um, the movement is most intense. And I think that really highlights um, the racialized nature of a lot of what is um, going on. So before turning into um, giving some snapshots that really show how the refugee, uh, the Muslim ban that was discussed is actually a phenomenon that is repeating itself in other parts of the country and actually that happened earlier in Europe than it did in the, in the US, I want to just make another point about um, xenophobic discrimination as foreignness discrimination. So in my work, I think about foreignness, and I'm not the only one to do this. There's other scholars like Nazi Taylor Saito who, who have done a similar thing. Thinking about foreignness as really being about the, be, the actual or perceived um, 
outsider status. So you're perceived as an, as an outsider, or maybe you are an outsider, to a given um, political community. And so I want to highlight that even though foreignness, of course, is an intersectional category that implicates race, religion, gender, class, the racialized exclusion that is at the core of xenophobic contestation often goes hand in hand with claims about who belongs to the political community. And those, that, that kind of political conception of the problem of xenophobia, I think, is an important overlay to the um, racial dimensions that we're discussing. And there's a lot of co-construction that I can't, or co-constitution that I can't get into. And I think, Khaled, your work does a really um, great job of, of, of highlighting some of the political and structural um, dimensions that I think must be highlighted when we're thinking about um, xenophobic um, exclusion. So to turn to some of the examples that, again, I think echo what we're seeing in this country and in some ways uh, preceded the most uh, virulent wave of, of xenophobic contestation that occurred in this country um, in 2015 and 16, arson attacks in, in Sweden, for example, were reported targeting refugee hosp hostels. There was a spike in hate crimes across um, Europe and Germany um, and Britain following uh, Brexit. And one interesting thing about Brexit is that the hate crimes, and I think this is the case in many places, even though the vast majority or the majority of claims were racially motivated hate crimes, the largest increases were in crimes targeting people because of disability and transgender identity. And so this idea that um, only certain minorities are impacted by xenophobic uh, backlash, I think must, we must understand that as a broad group of, of, of minorities as being impacted by that, even ones that are native in so many, in so many other um, respects. I'm rushing because I'm uh, sensitive to the time, but we'll keep going. So I've talked a little bit about some of the private uh, violence and actually want to add the example of, of South Africa, which I think is very important to highlight. So Letlohonolo, I think, did a very good job of highlighting the response um, of the world today to what is perceived as a threat to white South Africans um, in uh, South Africa. South Africa um, is a complicated place, as is every other country in the world. But the xenophobic violence in South Africa against black Africans has been especially notable. Going back to 2008, when there was you know, over 100,000 um, uh, African uh, migrants in South Africa who were displaced by violence, there were 62 killed. And in fact, that violence also targeted South Africans who were perceived um, as foreign as well. So it wasn't just foreigners who were caught up in that. The response from the countries that are now saying we urgently need to take in white South African refugees was completely absent. There was not a similar attempt to um, mobilize and show solidarity for recognized refugees in South Africa, like Somalis, who were on the front lines um, of that violence. And I think, again, that belies the deeply racialized um, nature of, of what is taking place. Moving to, to state um, policy, so I've been focusing on, on private uh, violence targeting uh, refugees and involuntary migrants all over the world. In 2015, um, Poland saw the election of a right-wing party, the Law and Justice Party, um, which was elected in, in part on its anti-immigrant um, uh, platform. And in 2016, so this is before the Muslim ban in the US, the Polish government already had started refusing, refusing to accept Muslim Syrian refugees. So first they were willing to accept Christian um, Syrian refugees and they were very explicit about saying this um, and very explicit about identifying Muslims as an inherent threat to the national um, identity of Poland. They had made this split. And then after the bombing in Belgium, I don't know if you recall this bombing that took place in, in, in Belgium, which was found not to involve any Syrians um, at all, uh, the government decided, well, actually, we're not accepting any um, Syrian refugees, not just Muslim ones, not, uh, we're not even taking um, the Christian ones. And so you have um, the Muslim ban a year earlier in a different country, and then it, com it completes to, uh, it expands to swallow up um, other religions that were previously um, incorporated. I also want to highlight the example of, of Kenya. This is an African country that hosts uh, uh, the largest refugee camp in, in the world, the Dadaab refugee camp. And in 2016, the government there attempted to shut down that refugee camp, which has um, almost a quarter million uh, Somali refugees. Um, and that was actually barred by a Kenyan court. And so the, the attempt there to try and shut that down was dissipated. I'm going to turn in the time that I, hi I have left to highlight um, 
incidents, I think, of, of racialized structural exclusion um, of, of migrants, and I gave this example again yesterday, apologies to people who heard me speak, it's the, it's the same one, but I think it's a very powerful example that really makes vivid um, the way that immigration law and policy that often flies under the radar in a world where we have the sorts of tweets and comments that President Trump is making, um, it, I think it's very important to remember that a lot of the uh, violence that uh, immigrants are experiencing across the world is actually a product of policy that reads as neutral and that remains uncontested and even including in the circles that are pushing back against the more explicit uh, versions of xenophobic contestation. So um, I want to talk very briefly about um, the death of 26 Nigerian girls um, and women in, in November 2019 in the Mediterranean. How many people have heard of this other than when I mentioned it yesterday at the, at the other presentation? Okay. So this, this is um, pretty typical in, in most audiences. So in 2017, late last year, media um, outlets reported the deaths of 26 Nigerian girls um, and women aged between 14 and 18. Okay, so these, uh, these are young, young girls whose bodies were found uh, floating in the, in the Mediterranean. There were many other individuals on the boat that was carrying um, these girls, including some survivors. Only two of the girls um, were identified by the time the Italian government um, buried them. One of them was a Muslim woman whose name is Marianne Shaka. The other one was a Christian woman. Her name is Osata Osara. And both of them were pregnant. So not only were their lives lost, but they were carrying, um, the, the, you know, they were pregnant. And what's, what's um, especially um, troubling about, about uh, that particular dimension of it is that that pregnancy is likely the result of sexual violence along the migrant route from Nigeria to um, Europe. So, and many of these girls were, uh, whose, whose bodies were found were wearing two layers um, of clothing, which people say suggests that they had been previously held in, in Libyan um, detention camps. And I don't know how many of you saw the images uh, that CNN uh, broke in Jan I think it might have been January or February, showing this, the uh, auctioning of black African migrants in Libyan slave markets. Okay, so this is explicit racial commodification of, uh, racialized commodification of, of people. You have lots of different people moving through Libya, but if you are a black migrant, your risk for slavery is dramatically higher than say you're coming from the Middle East and you're Arab. And so, so it's, it's, you know, what's happening there is completely um, terrifying, and I also want to highlight here the role of the U.S.-led NATO intervention um, into Libya, which is an important piece of explaining that country's um, implosion, and, and is an important piece of understanding how it is you can have modern-day slave markets again. Again, emphasizing the um, intervention um, of the United States, and this is under the Obama administration as well. Um, so when when these videos surfaced of the the Nigerian girls that I was just talking about. European leaders and African leaders were very quick to blame um, traffickers for the deaths of, of these girls. And traffickers and smugglers obviously have a role to play in um, a lot of the violence that, that I have been describing. But it's completely disingenuous to end the story there because the deaths of those girls and the many other who, others who will die after them and who are dying you know, as we speak and who have died in the past are actually um, predicted, and in some ways they are anticipated outcomes of the global governance regime that we have with respect to migration, which provides too few legal pathways for legal um, migration that is actually anticipated, expected, and relied upon, right? So first world economies in many ways are built with the presumption that there will be a migrant labor force, and, and probably one that is undocumented in pretty significant um, ways. And the absence of a legal framework that takes that into account um, results and produces what we are seeing um, right now. Um, another reason why it's disingenuous for African and European leaders to blame um, smugglers and trafficking in, uh, traffickers in this area is that in addition to prohibiting legal pathways for migration, uh, governments from both parts of, of the world, from Europe and from Africa, are investing very heavily in the militarization of the zones through which many of these um, migrants are trying to, to pass through. And so, um, 
although there is not as much attention on the militarization of these borders, on the lack of legal pathways for migration in an international system that is just so fundamentally um, integrated, I think it's important to put that side by side against the picture of you know, Donald Trump's tweets or whoever it is who makes explicit, explicitly racist and, and xenophobic um, statements because the structural is just as important um, as, as that. I'm going to stop here. Um, and in the Q&A can talk a little bit about anything that I have said or about the frameworks that I didn't have an opportunity to go um, into. But thank you. Um, thank you very much to our panelists. I think that had, there has really been some like rich discussion coming from each of the panelists. I'm sure the audience is dying of questions, so I'm just going to start off the conversation with asking some probing questions to the panelists, and then we'll give the audience an opportunity to ask whatever questions um, you would like to and contribute to the conversation in, in any manner you'd like to. I guess the first question um, that I have is, is, I mean, the theme of, 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 of today is also recentering our activism in the age of 45, right? So I, I'd like uh, the panelists to spend a bit of time speaking about like, what that activism looks like, whether in scholarship or in actual doing work in immigration and in the international sense. What does this activism look like? And then I wanted, uh, Professor Beydoun, specifically for you to, you know, you started a bit talking about anti-racism and, and about uh, black Muslims, um, but you, I, I'd like you to just go deeper in speaking about like how how black people, black Muslims are affected, particularly in the immigration sense, um, just to center their stories. And I also wanted to you know, touch on, I've been reading a lot of news articles that speak about the idea of illegal immigrants, to speak about like, what is the language that we're supposed to use when we talk about immigrants, because I, illegal doesn't sound right to me, so what language do, uh, are we supposed to use? And then Professor Achumi, I, I think you may, um, in the second half of your presentation, be leading to this, but what is the role of the international conventions and the international instruments that are available in dealing with this, um, I guess, some ways immigration, but also the convention on the international and the elimination of racial discrimination has a really broad definition of what racial discrimination is. So where does immigration and these conversations fit into the conventions? I just spoke. How hard is it for me to go on with those words? I, you know, yeah, I, I can go. Oh, okay. Thank you. I was going to go. <laughs> so, so it's important to know that two, two of the seven uh, states that were part of the initial Muslim ban were predominantly black uh, African nations, right? So Sudan and Somalia. Uh, so I want to read a, a, a quote from, uh, she was then a PhD student up at Stanford, a woman named Nasreen uh, El Amin who was traveling back to the United States from uh, her native Sudan on the day the travel ban was enacted. Uh, she says, quote, I think this order is a reflection of a larger trend in this country to criminalize black people, to criminalize immigrants, and to criminalize Muslims. And as a black Muslim immigrant, I'm really concerned about that. And I do think that, that the Somalis and Sudanese, people of African descent who are going to be affected by this, you know, I think they're going to be treated differently, uh, tr treated differently. Unquote. So she was actually handcuffed. She came back uh, at the uh, New York, uh, what is it called? Not LaGuardia, the other one. Yeah. JFK, yep. She was handcuffed <laughs> when, she, when she came to JFK. Um, and she realized that she was one of the only individuals that was restricted from coming into the country. The Muslims coming back into the country were handcuffed. Individuals who were Arab and South Asian weren't handcuffed. So I think her quote signifies that uh, black Muslims were affected by the travel ban, were obviously, you know, demonized and being kind of pegged as prospective terrorists, right? Individuals we can't let into the country because of uh, fear that they might be connected to terrorism, but then also criminalized, right? They were racialized in the sense that they'd be racialized here uh, by policemen in the neighborhood or policemen on the streets. So I think uh, Nisreen's uh, quote really illustrates that this really difficult intersection black Muslims face in the immigration context and I want to connect that to what happens with counter-radicalization. So uh, for those of us who know about counter-radicalization, uh, really specifically there's hardline policing programs whereby FBI agents work with local law enforcement in three cities. Los Angeles here, where it was initially piloted, 
uh, spearheaded by uh, a, UCLA, a UCLA Law School alumni. Second, Boston. Uh, and third, Minneapolis. And I want to speak specifically about Minneapolis because Minneapolis, again, is home to uh, uh, the biggest Somali Muslim population in the country. And again, a population that was directly impacted by the travel ban. To show how the travel ban and counter-radicalization dovetail and overlap. And also how indigence is, is impacted. So counter-radicalization is specifically deployed in uh, heavily working class and poor Muslim communities. I wrote an article about that called Between Indigence, Erasure, and Islamophobia in the California Law Review, uh, if you're interested in that specific intersection. 82% of Somalis living in Minneapolis live below or just at the poverty line, right? Many of them are uh, legal permanent residents. Many of them are recent immigrants. Many of them are undocumented. So there's this really uh, interesting and intimate connection between how the travel ban works and how counter-radicalization works. So counter-radicalization uh, can function as a vehicle to lead to expedited removals uh, of young Somali uh, youth, uh, men and women. So counter-radicalization and uh, the immigration uh, mechanism, specifically the removal process, work in conjunction with one another. Uh, counter-radicalization becomes uh, the filter, if you will, which helps identify individuals who are caricatured to be prospective radicals or tenuously connected to groups like Al-Shabaab and then uh, expedited. So uh, black Muslims are impacted in a myriad of ways. First, beyond the borders, obviously, as we saw with the travel ban. Chad was added uh, in the third rendition of the travel ban as one of the nation states. Uh, but then again, I think it's really important to kind of, uh, you know, blur the lines and see how uh, the immigration process um, isn't as fully distinct and you know, fully separated from the way war on terror policing functions domestically. There's a real synergy there that's really dangerous for communities uh, like black Muslim Somali communities in Minneapolis uh, and others as well. Sorry for shot, I don't know, I feel like I'm turned up for some reason. This morning. <laughs> Good. It's good to wake us up. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I, I, I wanted to address your question about sort of the, the, the theme about recentering activism, and I think, um, you know, what does that look like? What does that mean? And I, I, I think, you know, I have to come at this humbly, in part because I l have learned from the people who are doing the work in the streets, and so nothing that I'm going to say is sort of my brilliant insight into recentering <laughs> re activism. Um, but in doing interviews with youth organizers in Orange County, immigrant youth organizers in Orange County, over the past three years, um, one of the things that um, has, a couple of themes have been striking. And one uh, theme that's been striking uh, is sort of in the post-Trump uh, era, uh, there's been a, a rise of obviously engagement and activism, political activism. Um, aimed at sort of countering some of the most egregious um, uh, uh, <laughs> examples of, uh, uh, of kind of racism and xenophobia that the, that the administration has put forward. Um, and some of the youth activists that I've spoken to who say, this is really great, but where was everybody, you know, three years ago, and will they still be here three years from now? Um, and so I think one of the, and that's part of why just those conversations are part of what moved me to make sure to center this notion that we need to uh, look at both the long historical roots and the sort of historical trajectory uh, of exclusion and racism and think about how we build an activism that's actually responsive to not one administration or one sort of narrow set of policies, but an activism that's um, responsive to sort of the overriding um, in kind of institutionalized and structural racism um, that we're confronting um, and the sort of long history uh, of uh, structuring national identities in exclusionary ways and using that as a as a harsh edge uh, for uh, for really punishing um, and uh, and uh, marginalizing communities. Um, so that's one piece of sort of what I think recentering activism has to look like. And the other thing that again comes not from me or my insights, but from speaking with the. Um, young organizers who are doing the work is that need for um, sort of an intersectional and international understanding of the problem. Um, and that uh, comes through in those conversations where they talk about the sort of the need for um, the immigrants' rights and immigrant justice movement to, to align with 
Black Lives Matter around issues of criminal justice reform because that is the same conversation and not two conversations. Um, and the need for us to think about centering international rights and using um, international rights language in thinking about um, domestic problems because that is a, a way both to um, uh, to bridge uh, gaps between communities, but also to address some of the core problems um, that are um, th th that we're confronting. So I think those are some of the themes that I think we can draw on um, in, re in, in rethinking um, and reinvigorating um, the activism. Because what I worry about is a conversation that um, kind of takes on a just strictly partisan, um, you know, uh, kind of Democrat versus Republican um, sort of uh, 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 cast, where we don't actually then have to have any of the difficult conversations that um, that we're having on this panel, and that I think uh, we, that we need to have in terms of terminology. Um, you know, I, I, I like to think of people as people, and and you know, and when I think about immigrants, I think of them as immigrants. I actually think the part of the trouble with U.S. immigration law is that it is so complex that so many people that, you know, that you could easily say they lack status or are unauthorized actually have uh, a valid path to a lot of legal remedies under domestic law and are certainly entitled to protections under uh, international law. And so the, the labels, the, the, the formal legal labels are themselves problematic. Um, and then, of course, we we then kind of take a step back from the formal legal labels, which themselves are really more inherently complex than we suggest that they are, um, and and then we uh, and then we use these sort of caricatured um, terms like you know the illegal aliens or just illegals because we you know uh, that that term can can encompass a whole population uh, that ignores uh, the nuance uh, of the various protections uh, that people should have. Um, but I think we you know part of the kind of where I'll close is going back to the recentering activism theme. I think again drawing from the voice of the youth activists that I've been speaking with, we have to sort of recognize the ways that citizenship um, and the distinctions between immigrant and citizen um, are used in exclusionary ways uh, perpetually, and that you know, in itself it's a problematic concept that is going to carry with it um, these, uh, these inequalities. And unless we start talking about that in a robust way, we not only have to move beyond sort of uh, distinctions between uh, authorized and unauthorized migration, but we need to start thinking about um, how our distinctions between citizens and non-citizens um, and kind of bringing some people into the citizenship fold itself generates um, exclusions and justifies um, uh, justifies uh, dis discriminatory policies. Um, and so, so in, in rethinking and recentering activism, we need to think about the ways that citizenship has this exclusionary edge um, and that we need to reassess, uh, critically evaluate, um, and, and perhaps explode in these conversations. Um, so I, I completely agree with, with, with all of that. And, I, and one final thing that I would, I would add on this question of, of terminology, uh, starting with your, your last question first, is that I think there is something um, about all of the non-citizenship designations that emphasizes um, the status of certain individuals as political strangers, and by characterizing them as political strangers, then this leg legitimizes all sorts of um, political excuses from the nation, from the benefits of the nation, in ways that I think completely belies the interconnection that characterizes the lives of people even across large, largely geographically disparate um, contexts. And this goes back to the points I was making in my presentation about how U.S. intervention in other parts of the world is, is producing the displacement that then brings people to the doors of the United States of Europe. And I think, again, the language belies the interconnection that I think is actually a more fruitful way of understanding the way that you, you structure borders, not just geographically, but also um, politically as well. In terms of, of act activism, I think it's, it's um, really worth noting that refugees and involuntary migrants across the world are most supported by private citizens, right? We talk a lot about the role of the state and even of UNHCR, but in all parts of the world, um, migrants really find support from other citizens, from other migrants who are there. And so there is a quiet activism that is not discussed very much, but is actually the bedrock 
of taking care of people who move for reasons that they have um, no control over. And historically, that has been <coughs> the case as well. And I think um, highlighting that is, 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 is super um, uh, important. And then also thinking about the activism that followed immediately after some of the most egregious attempts by political leaders to exclude, I think, is really important. So we're familiar with the activism that took place here in the United States, but a similar thing happened in, in Europe where private citizens were actually on the forefront of responding to the needs of Syrian refugees in a way that completely contradicted some of the statements that were being made um, at, at um, the political level. I think from my perspective, and this echoes something that Jennifer said, I think one of the challenges is building transnational um, solidarity around these issues because um, the frames that dominate for thinking about the problem are nationalist. This is the big push, right? Populist nationalism is about the nation and, and really sets the discourse in a way that means that even advocates who are pushing back are thinking about maybe expanding the conception of the nation but aren't really thinking about what's happening outside of it that may be very much going to, to structuring the things that they're fighting against. So I think the real challenge becomes how do you build advocacy um, a, across uh, across borders, and, and it's definitely something that I'm thinking about in my work with the, with the UN. Thank you very much. Um, I think I'd open the floor to a few questions. Let's first try like four questions and see how much time we've left. Any questions? Yes. I'd like to hear more about surveillance, and I know that um, the Conde wanted to speak about that, but either of the other speakers? Okay. Um, yes. Okay, thanks. So the first question um, that was asked is to speak more about surveillance, particularly Professor Beydoun uh, wanted to do <laughs> some part of his presentation about surveillance, but also to hear from other panels if they have any thoughts about surveillance. My question is also for uh, Professor Beydoun. So I know you know who Juan Cole is, and he's also And then one final one. Um, I really appreciate everything all of you have talked about. And, and especially, especially um, Jennifer, when you said that this is a continuum and we can't look at this as an aberration in the history of this country. Um, I do have a question, though, because one thing about this form of the Trump Pence regime is, it, you know, the, the formulation of a and justice film, that's a whole history of where this campaign is. But what he says, what he says is that the, the, the spearhead and the, and the 
sort of the ram, the battering ram, of the xenophobic overall fascist fascist. Now this, that's why you have them going up to transgender and everything else. There's a whole program to this. When he went to Poland, he said to the south and to the west, to east, right? Those are the they're the non-Christian, they're the heathen, they're the this, the thing about international war, the bellicose nature of this regime in terms of active militarization and real war. The fascism is something no one will, it's like, I, I can bring this up at every conference and yet people <coughs> talk about, don't talk about that. And when you have a cancer, you have to identify the particular cancer, the form that you have if you're gonna, and the people are waiting for the 2018 elections to about changes. This is happening in Italy, this is happening everywhere in the world right would you speak to the question of fascism? Anyone can answer. Okay. So I guess we have four questions on the table, surveillance. Um, we have uh, kind of the propriety or impropriety of using the term Islamist, um, the concern about valuing black women's bodies. Uh, we have the question about the role of local law enforcement. Um, and finally, we have the question of fascism and addressing the concerns about fascism. So um, I guess since the first question was surveillance and was geared toward you, you want to? Yeah, so, so counter-radicalization uh, programming, uh, it, it was formally implemented under Obama in 2011 uh, through a program called Countering Violent Extremism. But it was actually practiced uh, roughly a decade before uh, via a program used by the NYPD called the Spying on Muslims program, where basically the structure wa was uh, FBI works closely with, lo with local law enforcement. Local law enforcement is tasked with developing uh, informants, seating informants, building those relationships in uh, Muslim spaces like masajid, mosques, community centers, Muslim student associations and so on. Uh, it's predictive in the sense that uh, the radicalization theory, which is exclusively focusing in on uh, Islam and Muslim identity, believes that you can predict when a Muslim is going to evolve or devolve into becoming a radical, right? And what's problematic about it is uh, the signals for radicalization are signals that uh, are protected by the free exercise clause, right? So if a Muslim woman decides to wear the hijab or a more conservative iteration of covering, that is a sign uh, of prospective radicalization. If a male decides to wear a thob, which many men do on Fridays and non Fridays, grow a beard, uh, again protected by the free exercise clause, that, those are um, emblematic of the process of becoming radicalized. But in addition to free exercise, it's also political speech. So if you're critical of domestic war on terror policy, if you're critical of American foreign policy, the war in Iraq, for instance, what's going on in in Palestine, those kinds of things become indicators of prospective radicalization. So there's a tension between um, in a Muslim being able to, to exercise his or her religious rights um, by virtue of maximizing the, that you, inv you invite the, the prospect of being uh, surveilled by the state um, or, uh, you know, again, exposing yourself to backlash from private actors. Let me, let me tie that really quickly to the second question because there's, there's a correlation there. So I don't know what a Islamist is, I don't know what an Islamo-fascist is, I don't know what a moderate Muslim is, um, I don't know what a peace-loving Muslim is, like all these qualifiers that individuals in the center, the left, and the right use. There's this entire vocabulary that is created and manufactured uh, initially by Orientalists, right? So Orientalist thinkers, we can think about a prominent American Orientalist like Bernard Lewis, Fouad Ajami, who's actually Arab, uh, individuals who were, uh, you know, had extreme influence and residence uh, in the state with the Bush administration, obviously, continuing with the Obama administration, where Obama was really clever with capitalizing on native informants, right? Individuals who looked like me, practiced Islam, um, but essentially legitimized war on terror policy, uh, but, you know, engaged in the kind of uh, accepting, tolerant, multicultural rhetoric that was central to that administration. So it's by use of uh, conspicuous Orientalists and Islamophobes during moments uh, we, we see during the Bush administration, again during Trump, but also through the uh, strategic use of native informants under progressive or liberal or democratic administrations um, like the Obama administration, where those words, whether they're uh, brazen and kind of violent nature or, uh, you know, or seem to be more, I, I, guess, you know, I guess, like acceptable in nature, like the moderate Muslim designation, become part of the strategy for advancing war on terror. 
uh, policies like the travel ban and like counter radicalization. All right, so I'll, I'll go and want to point out that the, or to add rather, that the surveillance problem is one that is, is global. And I think, Khaled, you do an excellent job of, of giving us the national picture. It's happening all over the world, and it, you see national security rhetoric justifying surveillance, especially of Muslims or people who are perceived to be Muslim. And, and the kind of global technology is um, truly uh, frightening. I was in um, New York maybe two weeks ago. There's a process going on within the UN where UN member states, that's all of the world and all, most of the countries in the world, are in the process of neg negotiating um, the first uh, agreement governing migration. This would be the first agreement that we have at the global level. And so much of the zero draft, so it's not yet anything that is um, final, is devoted to data collection. And, and, and when you look at the data collection service, uh, section, you would think that the problem with uh, global migration today is that there's not enough data collection um, around it. And we haven't talked about neoliberalism, but I think that we have to think about the role of economic structures in, in, in um, uh, producing a lot of what we're talking about here as well. And I think the role of the private sector and the profit and the money that is to be made from the surveillance industry is a huge, um, is a huge uh, part of it. In terms of gender, absolutely. And, and one of the reasons why I, I think the case of the Nigerian girls is especially striking is you will recall, and I mentioned this yesterday as well, the death of um, uh, Alan Kurdi, whose image mobilized a kind of humanitarian response for Syrian refugees um, that you know, comes nowhere near the silence um, that uh, followed the death of the Nigerian girls. And I think that the gendered and racialized nature of, of migrant exclusion is, is really, really worth looking into. Um, I was reading some accounts of the, journey, the journeys of um, African women moving from you know, West and North Africa to Europe, where the fact of being a black woman moving alone uh, raises the presumption um, that you are a prostitute and it is one that you cannot rebut irrespective of whether you have um, been forced into a situation where you, you are engaging in prostitution or you've chosen to do so. Just being black and female means that you are um, marked as sexually available and expendable. And so I, I think that's a very important thing um, to highlight, and I feel remiss for not having added it in my initial um, comments. The construction of racial identity, I think that question is, is a really, really important one. And so with the xenophobic violence, for example, example, that happened in 2008 in South Africa, the South African government was quick to say, this is not um, xenophobia, this is just you know, isolated acts of criminality that have nothing to do with, with xenophobia. These are just criminal elements targeting um, other groups. And there is, within the South African government, and I think in many circles in, on the African continent, resistance to thinking about conflict that is definitely racial, there's resistance to thinking about it as, as racial when it involves intra-black um, contestation, which is happening in the shadow of colonially constructed, I think, um, intuitions about how race works in the center. So I think there's a lot of work to be done, and South African scholars are doing this, and, and, I, and, and Zimbabwean scholars are doing this, people are doing this in the region to say that just because it's intra-black, this should not pass as not being um, racial. You know, and colorism, which you mentioned, I think is, is um, one dimension of this, but in South Africa specifically, the project of using you know, ethnic differences or linguistic differences to basically racialize entire categories in ways that pit them against each other as one that goes as far back as the apartheid government that goes back um, to colonialism. And some of the most interesting work that I have found that tries to unpack understanding um, xenophobia in South Africa is the work that is tying it to this historical um, project of white supremacy that persists even when you know you may not have um, white actors in the forefront <coughs> engaging in any of the of the violence, so I think that's a very powerful um, intervention and, and one that is worth keep worth thinking about further. And then Litlochenol, I realized that I didn't answer your, your your second question, which is about international legal frameworks. And I would be remiss not to talk about international legal frameworks when I'm the international lawyer on the panel. So I want to just <laughs> highlight um, two things, which is that the uh, International Refugee Convention, which Jennifer highlighted, prohibits discrimination among refugees on the basis of race, religion, nath national origin. So the Muslim ban, the Trump Muslim ban, that's a violation of international refugee law, which the United States <coughs> is bound by. And international refugee law also requires a number of procedural safeguards that a lot of the 
um, policies that Jennifer was talking about is actually in violation of. And so there's, there's violations of international refugee law that are clear and uncontested. International human rights law, which is a separate body um, of law, as you mentioned, has a broad uh, definition of racial discrimination. So in, in, in under the Convention for the Elimination of Racial Discrimination, racial discrimination is discrimination on the basis of, of race, no, color, um, ethnic origin, national <coughs> origin, um, and one other that is escaping me because I'm, I'm tired. But one thing that the convention does is that it creates a carve out for citizenship status, right? So national origin for sure, but citizenship status is a little bit more equivocal. And what governments often do is they often will engage in pretextual um, exclusion of groups on the basis of their immigration status that is actually racialized or it is based on national origin. So they try and get around the prohibition by trying to push it into the category um, of citizenship. So in general, I think international human rights law, even though it takes us a good distance, struggles to deal with and undercut state sovereignty and international law very strongly um, protects the right to exclude except in these you know, areas dealing with refugees specifically. And there's a lot of work to be done, I think, to, to, to undercut um, the existing perceptions of state sovereignty and international law. So I'll leave it at that. So I think we're at time, so I'll just take the two pieces that, uh, we, that haven't been addressed. One was the local um, law enforcement piece, and then the other was fascism, <laughs> which seems like a good way to conclude the panel, right? Um, so, so I think on uh, on the local law enforcement piece, uh, yes, I mean I think one of the one of the uh, tools that has been used um, for a long time um, to effectuate. Uh, more aggressive immigration policy is to rely on uh, state and local actors to do some of that frontline work um, and to use the criminal enforcement systems at the state level uh, to bring people into the system. So that was the Secure Communities Program, um, which said everyone who's arrested by a state or local actor will be screened through the DHS database and then uh, DHS can at their option uh, pursue them. Um, uh, Secure Communities was a program that was heavily criticized, resulted in racial profiling. There were a number of studies and the Obama administration in the late stages said we're not gonna do that anymore we're going to have a sort of secure communities light program where we're going to have priorities about who we go after. It wasn't that radical a, a, a change, but it was a sort of a walking back from it. And when Trump came in, he said, well, the mechanism's there, right? We're just going to roll it right back out. Um, so we have this sort of very overt reliance on states and localities to do this work. And one of the responses on the part of some states and localities was to say, we don't want to do that work. And in a variety of ways, um, tried to either change policies around arrests in order to mitigate the potential effects of screening um, or to more overtly declare themselves sanctuary and what we've seen uh, obviously it, it, in this sort of recent um, kind of round is the uh, federal government um, kind of suing and criticizing heavily uh, invoking some pretty heavy rhetoric against states and localities that are trying to um, uh, in, in some ways limit their involvement and even those limitations are imperfect um, but but that's one of the real battlegrounds and so I think when we think about sanctuary cities we can see that as another site where much of the criticism about kind of excessive federalization of crime control policy excessive federal law enforcement dollars going to states and localities for militarized policing um, this is that conversation too right it's another iteration of that conversation about uh, about sort of how much uh, how much federal how many federal resources how much federal involvement how much federal screening uh, on the streets is really good uh, for communities. Um, and then I wanted to close with your point. So when I talk about it as a continuum, I think I want to stress uh, the, something like secure communities is an example, right, where you've got, uh, you've got the mechanism in place, you have some sort of notion that a benevolent and reasonable administrative state will not use these things in crazy ways. Um, and then when you don't have a benevolent and reasonable administrative state, obviously all of the tools and mechanisms are there. Um, and so, so I think that's why it's important to think about the continuity. That is not to say uh, that there's not something distinctive and dangerous about the rhetoric. And I think when we think about the private violence point, which many people um, have touched on here, that propensity to private violence is obviously heavily amplified um, and definitely um, uh, <laughs> seems more acceptable in a context where, um, where administrations, where uh, world leaders are using language that, that actually seems to endorse um, those sorts of behaviors. Um, so that means uh, you not only have sort of public policies that might have problematic <coughs> edges, but you have that in tandem with uh, administrative uh, agents that have no desire 
where to use them in discretionary um, ways, and that coupled with um, unleashed private violence um, without a check on that. And that is distinctive um, and concerning, and I don't, I don't want to minimize that. So I think while we keep in mind continuities, we also need to note um, what's distinct and how that gives rise um, to certain uh, dangerous um, and, uh, and, and, and you know, I'll just say dangerous and, and scary um, <laughs> uh, situations. Um, thank you very much. I think I'm reminded of the words of um, one of my favorite writers, Audrey Lord, who says that revolution is not a one-time event. And I think like talking about recentering our advocacy is to remember those words that like it's not in the Trump era but like we have to continue activating and creating. So thank you very much for joining us for this wonderful, exceptional panel. Um, that this is the end of the panel, but just a reminder that there will be another panel in about like 10 minutes on uh, criminal justice and policing. Thank you, everyone. Um, so thank you again for our wonderful um, panel and moderator. Um, we're going to um, continue with our programming in about 10 minutes, so, you know, stretch your legs, um, you know, um, do whatever. And, um, yeah, thanks again for being here. All right, everyone, we're getting ready to get started on the next panel, so if we could quiet down. Thank you so much. Well, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Okay, that was that was atrocious. Um, good morning, good morning, everyone. Good morning. All right, I'm not going to do the Wakanda salute. I will save that for later. Um, but I did bring some Wakanda into the room today. So um, shout out to Black Panther. Okay, so today this panel is going to be focusing on uh, criminal justice and criminal justice reform. Uh, over the last uh, ten years. Um, Crime rates have decreased. Uh, incarceration rates have decreased by roughly 13% during the Obama administration at the state, local, at the state and local and federal levels. Um, California has helped to lead this particular um, trend as California has decreased its incarceration rate by approximately 23% between 2006 and 2010. But even if we were to maintain these trends, um, we wouldn't reach the levels of uh, incarceration that, that were represented in the 1970s until about 2040. So I want to be clear that these are modest decreases in what is a historically high rate of incarceration, where we're the largest incarcerator in the entire world, um, representing roughly 5% of the world's population, but 25% of the world's incarcerated rate. So this era of reform, as it has come to be known, was uh, a result of significant grassroots mobilization, particularly here in the state of California, significant reforms with regard to the treatment of drug crimes, particularly marijuana and property crimes, and the shifting of prison populations from the state level to local jails and facilities. Now this is what, our, our, this is what some of our panelists will talk about. What is the future of these kinds of reforms? Are we entering into an era of retrenchment under the Trump administration? Are the efforts of the Obama administration and local communities like Los Angeles and the state of California going to be rolled back by an aggressive administration seemingly um, uh, intent on reestablishing the war on drugs, funding militaristic uh, uh, police equipment uh, to be distributed to local law enforcement agencies across the country, um, targeting uh, low-level drug offenses and targeting states like California who, is, who have legalized marijuana. Um, this combined with efforts to essentially criminalize whole uh, communities that are undocumented with, st with stepped up uh, ICE um, enforcement, terrorizing communities across the country um, is what we're sort of grappling with in this sort of era of reform and this in, in the introduction of this era of retrenchment. So we have this question about how this, this trend toward the, the decreased rate of incarceration will fare under the Trump administration. But at the same time, while we have these sort of policies that have resulted in the uh, arresting of increasing rates of incarceration and the encouragement of a decrease in crime, we also have the expansion of a surveillance state 
where law enforcement agencies are increasingly using predictive policing, electronic surveillance, hotspot te technology to perfect the way in which they saturate communities of color. Right. So in what ways will the Trump administration accelerate these uh, particular kinds of practices, these, this intrusion of uh, the privacy interests of communities of color? And the last question that I think many of our panelists, I hope, will take on is this question of what happens to folks when they are incarcerated? Um, what happens within the confines of prisons and jails? The Justice Department under the Obama administration had been fairly aggressive in uh, engaging in pattern and practice investigations, resulting in consent decrees for, uh, for example, the County of Los Angeles and our jails and facilities to try to make them safer for people who are detained there. And the question is, what kind of Justice Department will we have with regard to the rights of incarcerated people? And so our panelists will take up these and many other questions, and so I'll turn it over to them. Uh, we will hear first from Sunita Patel, who is a, an assistant professor of law here at UCLA. She's also the director of the Veterans Legal Clinic. We will then hear from Lisa Holder, uh, who is a lecturer in law here at UCLA, where she teaches a, uh, a class on civil rights and police accountability. She also has her own uh, legal practice based out of Pasadena. And then we'll hear from uh, Professor Devin Carbato, uh, who is the Harry Prager Professor of Law and Vice Chancellor of uh, Bruin X Equity and Inclusion. Uh, so I'll turn it over to Sunita. Well, I first want to thank the organizers of this amazing convening. Um, it, it's, it's very fitting of the times, but also of UCLA Law School to, to bring together such an excellent group of speakers um, uh, for this day-long symposium. And also, it's, it's just wonderful to be here with these esteemed co-panelists, so thank you very much for having me. Uh, so I'm going to focus a little bit on sort of the theme of centering our advocacy um, and whether it's possible and how social justice advocates might consider the tool, it's just a tool, one of the tools, for, uh, of civil rights litigation to intervene or put a wedge or kind of forestall some of the things that are happening today. Um, and in particular, I'll focus on the policing crisis that we're, we're in, that, that we've been in for decades and since we can remember, um, but that we're also in, in a particularly acute way finding ourselves in today. So we can think of two uh, general categories of what I, what, I, what I would call structural reform litigation. The first is um, the sort of traditional class action lawsuit that seeks an injunction to try to stop or prevent constitutional rights violations from occurring. So that, that means that um, it's a bucket of cases where the remedy you're asking for is on behalf of a group of people whose rights have been violated in a similar sort of way. And these cases typically ask for pol policy changes, not only monetary um, relief. So here you can kind of think in your mind of the stop and frisk case in New York. Um, during the Obama administration, there was a lot of attention paid to this, the second type of structural reform litigation um, that Professor Oshen uh, mentioned, which are the cases stemming from the Department of Justice's authority to investigate and litigate civil rights and constitutional violations. And here you can think of what happened in Ferguson and Baltimore. Now these two types of cases are very different for different reasons. Um, and, you know, I guess it's, it's worth saying that the massive investigatory authority that the Civil Rights Division has um, allows us to uncover much more than the civil discovery tools that are, that are available in the first set of cases. Um, so the reports that we're, many of us are familiar with that were issued in the last eight years were, you know, are scathing, um, but unfortunately they are not surprising to many people who are familiar with police excesses that have been happening for decades. Um, but what's interesting is that many of the consent decrees, um, and in particular the, the last few, go well beyond Fourth Amendment doctrine and they seek reforms that a court is likely unable to actually order, okay? So these are some of the things that are helpful about um, the Department of Justice tool. Um, now there's many criticisms that we can have of this tool as well. Um, the, 
Department of Justice has implemented some, but not enough methods for local residents and for the black and brown communities who they're advocating on behalf of to actually become involved in those cases and actually have a voice in what the reforms should be. So that's one, one critique. Um, another is that the, um, these consent decrees really center around and prop up something called community policing. And community policing is, um, in my view, a theory of crime enforcement that tends to prioritize the community's law, I mean, excuse me, the policing um, aspect of community policing over community priorities. Um, and we're sort of living through one of the reasons that we just can't rely on federal enforcement and consent decrees. So 19 consent decrees were left to the current um, Attorney General Sessions. And you know it's very predictable that those consent decrees are in a state of crisis. Um, and that was the case when the Clinton administration left as well. And the Los Angeles P Police Department was under a consent decree. So the paradigm of this Department of Justice is that activists shouldn't have a First Amendment right, that police need military-grade equipment to protect themselves, and that that's really what they're, where they're going to focus their resources and attention. So let me just lay out a couple of specifics that occurred under number 45. I, I really like that that's the, the title of the um, program, number 45, and a few of the interesting responses that might give us a window into uh, how, to you, how, how to think about advocacy under this time. So um, we didn't need proof that uh, Attorney General Sessions would um, do things uh, to prop up the uh, police superpowers, but in his first few months, he confirmed that he was gonna step aside and encourage the growth of police power. Um, in the day after he was sworn into office, um, number 45 issued a, an executive order instructing the Department of Justice to support law enforcement efforts nationwide to restore public safety to all of our communities. And he formed a task force to redirect the department's um, resources and efforts. Um, Sessions then criticized all the consent decrees in a memo um, the, that he issued the following month. He said that they were creating barriers to police work and public safety, and he claimed the decrees actually harmed black communities and risked the public safety of police. And he called for a review into each of the consent decrees to sort of stall and, and halt the, pro the, proceed the, proceed pro the process from moving forward. Um, and so this sort of set the stage to actually disrupt um, what was happening and what and to gut what the former administration had had started to put in place. So a month um, after you know Sessions was sworn in, he asked the court, a federal judge in Baltimore, to stall and prevent the decree from receiving court approval. So that consent decree had been signed um, and filed with the court two weeks before the inauguration. Okay, and so. Then, and another example is in uh, Chicago. So a few days, just literally a few days before the inauguration, there was an agreement in principle that was signed between Mayor Rahm Emanuel and um, the Department of Justice. And in that decree, Chicago, the city of Chicago pledged to allow courts, a court to become involved in the reform process of the, of the police department. Um, and both of the reports in Baltimore and, and Chicago were um, you know, they're hundreds of pages long. They show sexual harassment and, and other abuse of um, black women. They show a particular targeting of mentally ill um, residents. It, it's just, they're, you know, it, they're, the Trump administration has sort of chosen to ignore the facts, right, which, we know, which is sort of par for the course. So then in early June, um, without the pressure of the Department of Justice, the mayor sort of sidetracked and backtracked from, um, from that um, agreement uh, and seemed to suggest that court, uh, court involvement wasn't necessary. He hired um, th uh, about 1,000 new police officers. So um, we can see that without some pressure, some outside pressure, the local, the local police departments, the local governments may really not do anything to move towards reform. And so a respo the responses in both of these cities give us a little bit of an idea of some of what might be possible, and we can think about others as well. So um, the same day that the court was to consider 
the Department of Justice request in Baltimore, a group of advocates um, represented by the NAACP Legal Defense Fund filed a motion to intervene. So intervention is a tool for some of you who take it, it, I think it gets covered in most of the civil procedure classes. It's a tool to say, I want to sit in the shoes of whoever filed this lawsuit because I don't think that they're going to adequately represent my interests. And, um, and so if it was granted, LDF and the groups and the individuals that filed that motion to intervene would be able to move forward and enforce the consent decree, okay? And then in Chicago, two weeks after the media kind of was reporting that the mayor was not going to move forward, um, a large coalition of civil rights activists and attorneys filed their own um, class action lawsuit using all of the evidence and the data that had been um, released through the Department of Justice's fact-finding investigation, okay? And so that group included uh, Black Lives Matter in Chicago. Um, they put up a, huge, a, a website so that there would be a lot of transparency around what was going, what, what was happening in the process. Um, and so what, what you can observe there is that there's been an attempt to try to salvage some of what was the Obama administration's legacy around policing um, because we know that the DOJ now is unwilling and is l frankly just not able to protect the interests of black and brown people when it comes to the criminal justice system or policing. You know, but really local advocates, um, if you spoke to people who were on the ground in those 19 cities, many of them were pretty unsatisfied with the consent decrees that came, that came out of the DOJ investigations. And so this might be um, actually a nice moment where people can sort of take that, take that using intervention or, or filing their own cases, try to move things forward on their own. Um, and I don't want to leave you with sort of an overly optimistic or a rosy picture around structural reform litigation and class action lawsuits because um, they are very expensive, they are very slow, um, the Floyd litigation in New York took 14 years to get a decision by a judge, okay? So that's what we're talking about. Um, and it's very difficult to get the evidence that's necessary to withstand numerous procedural hurdles and to mount the, po the specific policy claims, which are different, the evidence is different for the policy claims than for um, damage actions. And, you know, the criticism from litigation in the 1950s and 60s still stands. Most of these cases are led by lawyers um, and the class members and the plaintiff organizations, their voice sort of falls to the side, to the sideline at a certain point. But given the lessons that we've learned from um, the Brown versus Board era, can we move forward in a different way today? Um, I would argue that class action tool, class action is a tool but never the sole tool that activists can use to build some grassroots power and lead to wins beyond the courtroom. Um, I think that's where, that's the, the place where the terrain is most contested and, and, um, and most important. Um, and some of the law students in this room, some of you, are going to be the civil rights attorneys fighting number 45. So how will you do things differently? How will you apply the critical lessons that you're learning um, in your law school education to help um, change change the course to change things moving forward so I'll, I'll leave things there thank you thank you next we'll hear from Lisa Holt hi everyone uh, and I uh, I do want to thank you all for inviting me here it's uh, it's a it's, it looks like a wonderful gathering and um, I'm excited to be a part of it uh, you know, I just want to start off by saying that, you know, the way that we're sort of experiencing Trump and Trumpism, it's sort of like, you know, you can't take your eyes away from a train wreck. Um, every single day there's some new major gaffe or something absurd is happening. And I think what's happening is that liberals and progressives and civil rights, uh, civil rights leaders, et cetera, we're, we're so distracted with the day-to-day -day and minute-to-minute -minute debacle um, that is Trump, that we rarely get around to taking stock of the big picture. And one of the reasons why I'm grateful for a forum like this is because it gives us the opportunity to, to, to sort of move above the fray for a few hours 
and do a critical systemic analysis of Trumpism from a critical race theory, with a critical race theory lens. You know, I am a litigator. You know, I, I argue cases. I bring the types of uh, race discrimination class actions that Professor Patel is talking about. And I do share her reservations about that tool. It is just one tool in the toolbox. Um, and it is the tool, however, that many of you who do, be, who do move into civil rights law will be, will be using, will be utilizing. So how do we disarm Trump from a civil rights litigator's perspective? You know, one of the things that I, that I usually do when I'm doing this type of litigation analysis, broad lit litigation analysis, um, is, you know, you think about, well, how do you, we have to expose the problem first. So first we have to expose Trump's racist agenda, analyzing its disparate impact on people of color, and looking at the systemic harm to communities of color. So that's the first step. And then we figure out how to use this tool of civil rights litigation to disarm the policies that are wreaking havoc on black and brown communities. So right now I just want to go through this exercise of doing sort of uh, taking, a, a looking, taking a macro lens and looking at the Trump Sessions DOJ agenda that we've seen in the last 18 months. And can we, is, is it clear from a, from, a, from a legal perspective, is it clear that this is, a, that this is an agenda that is racist, is having a disparate in, impact, and involves disparate treatment when it comes to people of color? Well, here's the evidence. First, we've seen the reversal of the Obama uh, Attorney General Holder position on private prisons, right? We had a lot of momentum moving forward after 20 years of battling against private prisons as being extremely destructive and especially destructive to communities of color and immigrant communities. We had a DOJ that was finally listening to us and saying, okay, the federal government is going to disavow private prisons. We're not sending in people to those prisons anymore. Well, since, uh, since this new DOJ, this new administration, that has been completely reversed. What else do we have? We have the Muslim ban. We have the, the DACA ban. We have the targeting of undocumented immigrants of color to eject them from this country. We have what most recently the DOJ in, in this month has announced that they are suing sanctuary cities in California because they want these sanctuary cities to disavow that position and to force the state, and they want to force this state to, to permit police officers to assist ICE in ejecting immigrants of color. And they also want to make sure that businesses are also assisting ICE in, 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 in locating workers, immigrant workers, and ejecting them. So DOJ is now spearheading this suit against sanctuary cities. What else is the DOJ doing? Well, we've talked about how they we, and we will continue to talk about on this panel how they are foregoing oversight of abusive police agencies. Under the Obama administration, it was clear that the DOJ was going to get involved in, in uh, using their massive power to investigate uh, rogue police officers and rogue agencies. Right at the beginning of this uh, administration, the DOJ announced that, no, we don't want to do any oversight of the police. We don't want to hear about police abuse or police misconduct. We support the police. They're our friends. We support, support law enforcement. The DOJ is not getting involved in police abuse cases. What else have we seen the DOJ doing? They're promoting more restrictive voting laws. They are, they are 
promoting policies to make sure that they put the nail in the coffin of affirmative action. Okay? So recently, they have, they have launched a probe into Harvard University's affirmative action policy, or their diversity recruitment policies. And, and they have made it clear at this point that they are on the hunt <coughs> to bring a case about reverse discrimination to make sure that universities cannot promote diversity. Right now, their target is Harvard. <coughs> okay, and what else are they doing? Some of the, 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 the lighter, the lighter policies. They are keeping dossiers on activists of color. They're keeping, they're, they're doing probes and keeping dossiers on, on some of the major activists in Black Lives Matter, in the Black Lives Matter movement but they're not keeping any of these dossiers or doing any investigations of white supremacist leaders. And then, as Professor Patel mentioned, they're gutting the consent decrees that were put in place during the Obama administration. Okay? That's so, that's, 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 that's the, that's the, the, pol that's the evidence that of the policies that are, that are clearly discriminatory. You know, as, as, as litigators, we also, we don't know, we don't, we don't, we look for official policies that are clearly discriminatory, but we also look for things that we call stray rem remarks. What are some of the comments, the kind of communications that are coming out of this administration and the Justice Department that, are, that can serve as evidence of a, of a, of a racialized agenda? Well, some of the stray remarks that we're all familiar with, but we need to look at them now cohesively, is uh, Trump's comments about promoting immigration, if it's immigration from places like Norway. Okay? Trump's, Trump's comments about how countries in Africa and the Caribbean are shithole countries. Trump's comments that Mexican immigrants are rapists and criminals. Trump's retweeting anti-Muslim content of British neo-Nazi groups. Trump's comments in, uh, about uh, the situation in North Carolina with the alternative right march and his comments that, well, yeah, there were bad actors on all sides. And then, in addition to stray remarks, we're going to look at the comment. We're going to look at the, um, the conduct of some of these players, like Trump and the, and the leaders of the DOJ. What, it, what, is, what, is their, what does their conduct tell us about whether or not they harbor a tremendous amount of racial animus that fuels their policies? Well, their conduct is that they align themselves with avowed white supremacists like David Duke and Steve Bannon. Steve Bannon's most recent comment in the last week or so was he said in front of a, in, in front of a group uh, where he said he was giving a speech to that when they call you a racist, you should see that as a badge of honor. This is what he said in front of a group of alt-right, of his alt-right followers. Okay. So they're aligning themselves with, with avowed, known white supremacists. So all of these policies and conduct, and the conduct that we're seeing, has a disparate impact on people of color, a disparate impact. All of, these, all of this conduct, these comments, and these policies that we're seeing show clear racial animus toward people of color. Disparate impact and racial animus are the legal and evidentiary benchmarks that litigators use when you are bringing race-based legal claims. Okay? So I just laid out the evidence before you. What are litigators going to do about it? Since we have a clearly 
racist administration with a racialized agenda that is seeking to disenfranchise, further disenfranchise, um, and, and eliminate the civil rights gains of people of color. Well, one of the things that we can try and do is see if there is a way to marshal all of this evidence of disparate impact and racial animus and, um, and prosecute some of the key players. Okay, is that possible? I mean, is it possible to bring a race-based discrimination claim against the DOJ um, and its leadership in light of this clear record of disparate treatment? And I think that these are things that lit future litigators and current civil rights litigators need to be thinking about over the next three and possibly eight years of Trump, or seven, right? And maybe, maybe 15 if that lackey who's vice president takes over afterwards. So, you know, how, we need to think about, I mean, whenever you're talking about suing the federal government or suing an agency in the federal government, you always have to worry about 11th Amendment issues, okay, and, and how they're going to say, well, we're the federal government. We're, the, we're, we're immune from any type of suit. But there are, there are very discreet laws where that immunity is waived. So there's the, there's the uh, Federal Tort Claims Act. So it, it may be possible to think about a way to sue the, the, the Department of Justice for their, for their disparate treatment and the, in these policies that are clearly racist under the Federal Tort Claims Act. Um, we could perhaps bring a, a, a suit on behalf of communities of color and individuals of color, for instance, who are being harmed by the absence of oversight of police agencies. Right? Since they've, they've, so DOJ has abandoned that, and people are certainly going to be harmed. There's going to be more abuse. There's going to be less accountability. Can we bring a lawsuit under the, under the Federal Tort Claims Act to sue the Department of Justice for, for dereliction of duty in abandoning, abandoning their oversight responsibility when it comes to abuse of police departments? Okay? Um, and I have more comments. I have no more time. <laughs> Um, but I do want, I, I, I do hope that people, we, we can continue this conversation about some of the offensive, the, the, how we want to go on the offensive at this point and start suing, not only suing the police, but suing the DOJ. Thank you very much. So I'm going to stand because I have a PowerPoint and I won't be able to present without uh, looking at the slides. Uh, so let me begin by thanking the organizers again for conceiving of this event and for inviting my participation. Indeed, I think we should give them uh, all a round of applause before I... Uh, <laughs> so what I thought I might do in the limited time that I have is to decenter Trump and his regime. Um, not because I think it's unimportant to mark how... Trump and Trumpism might be, in many ways, shifting the democratic landscape, um, but rather to suggest that with respect to race and criminal justice, our democratic landscape has long been the site for, not an obstacle to, racial violence. Significantly, this problem of racial violence, which I will describe, um, is not simply something of the right. It's been a function of ordinary politics and ordinary law enforcement, uh, ordinary law and order commitments through which black people, among other people of color, have become the presumptive and indeed necessary bodies to survey, uh, to police, to incarcerate, and to kill. Um, central to my point of departure then is the idea that against the backdrop of Trump and Trumpism, it's relatively easy for people to 
maintain a certain degree of racial respectability by simply engaging in what I call the politics of the three Ds. So disidentifying, disassociating, and differentiating, which is to say, in our current political moment, distancing oneself from Trump becomes a kind of politics unto itself in ways that lies how ordinary politics have been extraordinary violence in the lives of black people. So part of what I want to do then is to go way, way back in time, pre-Trump, a year and a half or so, um, <laughs> to explain black people's vulnerability to a particular kind of state violence, um, police violence. And the point that I want to make, I don't think is particularly controversial, which is to say that police violence against African Americans transcends the conduct of individual officers engaging in individual acts of violence against individual people. It's more structural. And when we say that something is structural, I don't know that we're always careful about articulating what that might mean. So that's in part what I want to do. Um, and along the way, I'll say something about mass um, criminalization and predatory policing, uh, which are aspects of the race and police violence problem, which I think we need to put into sharp relief. Um, but before I go on, I want to engage in a kind of series of is-nots about police violence, and this requires a call and response. So you have to wake up if you're not already awakened. And um, every time I read a particular line, there'll be a parenthetical that I need you to read. And these are in parentheticals, not because they're unimportant, but they're because of cue that it's your turn. So for example, if I say, <laughs> it's not simply about bad apple cops, you say, it's structural. You gotta say it like you mean it. You gotta say it loud. <laughs> um, it's not simply about implicit bias. It's structural. It's not exceptional. It's structural. It's not just a problem for black men. It is racist and trans black women as well. It's not new. It's historical. It's not America. always illegal. It's not always constitutional. It's not inevitable. All right, so again, I think these parenthetical asides are not parenthetical asides. They're actually core dimensions of understanding the problem, it seems to me, but thank you for uh, indulging in that way. This is not your only call and response moment, as you will see. <laughs> but let me now offer a model for thinking about race and police violence, and I want to be clear that I'm not purporting to provide a total theory explanation. That would be really presumptuous of me. I simply want to identify some factors that I think are at play with respect to black people's exposure to police violence. So here's a schematic, and you'll note that the first two points on the schematic basically go something like this. Repeated police interactions expose you to the possibility of violence. So if you're not in the zone of police contact, you're outside of the zone of possible police violence. So repeated police interactions in this way creates a condition of possibility for police violence. That's really the first two points. The second point, again, I don't think is particularly remarkable, particularly controversial, particularly insightful. It is this, that police culture, police trainings, and police unions can contribute to police violence. So if it's the case that police culture at least implicitly encourages police violence, that's what you get. If it's the fact that police trainings just attend police violence, that's what you get. And if police unions are overly invested in protecting police officers rather than dealing with cops who engage in violence, that is what you get. Now, the next part in the schematic asks something like the following problem. So assume that there's been some instance of police violence. Let's assume that that's happened. The question is, how does that violence interact with the legal system? How does the legal system, in other words, process uh, police violence? And here are some consequences that I think we need to think about. One um, way in which violence is processed is that it becomes justifiable force. And there are a number of concrete ways in which this happens. So a prosecutor, for example, might decide not to bring charges. That's a moment in which the violence becomes justifiable force. You know the case. Or the prosecutor might bring charges and the grand jury chooses not to indict. That's another moment in which violence becomes justifiable force. Or the prosecutor brings charges, the grand jury indicts, and the jury or judge says, reasonable. Yet another moment in which violence is translated into justifiable force. So let's move now to qualified immunity and indemnification. I can't say much about qualified immunity. It's a complicated body of law. If I go in that hole, I won't come back. <laughs> <laughs> and that would not be good. The basic idea is that it erects a barrier a real barrier to suing police officers civilly. That's all I think I can say without, again, getting in that hole. 
With respect to indemnification, the problem here is this. Assuming that I win a lawsuit against a particular police officer, typically the officer will not pay, which is to say the officer is indemnified because the city pays. So here's the data on this. So my colleague Joanna Schwartz uh, did a study on this particular point, and you can see the profound gap between what individual officers pay um, when you manage to win a case and what um, governments pay, 171 versus 735 uh, million. It's a, it's, a, it's, a big, it's a big, big gap. The final point here with, with, with respect to the legal system interaction with police violence is departmental non-liability, meaning you try holding a department liable for the act of violence in which an officer engages. You won't be able to do it. Why do we care about this? Well, it creates a disincentive for police officers to exercise care. Think about it this way. If I'm an officer and I know at the front end that at the back end my act of violence is going to be justifiable force or I'm going to be protected by qualified immunity or I'm going to be indemnified or the department will not be held accountable, then there's no incentive for me to exercise care with respect to when and how I use violent force. So this takes us right back to the police violence problem. Does this account for everything? No. Does it identify some factors that we need to think about? Yes. So I want to spend the rest of my time identifying some of the specific variables that cause African Americans to have repeated police interactions. Because I'm saying this is point zero, if you like, or ground zero for understanding uh, one's exposure. There are lots of things we can talk about with respect to why uh, black people have um, this kind of exposure. We could talk about background racial inequality. We could talk about racial segregation. I have limited time, so I'm going to talk about mass criminalization, predatory policing. I won't have time to talk, to talk about Fourth Amendment law, so I'll just say it's very, very, very bad. That's all I'll say. <laughs> and um, move on to mass criminalization. So what do I mean by mass criminalization? By mass criminalization, I mean two things. One, I mean the criminalization of relatively non-serious activities. And two, the diffusion of criminal justice actors, criminal justice norms, and criminal justice practices into other domains of the welfare state. So think about the school to prison pipeline. That's a moment in which criminal justice system is doing work in some other dimension of the welfare state. Think about the immigration regime. That's another site in which criminal justice norms, actors, and practices are doing work in other dimensions of the racial state. So look at each of these um, predicate crimes as I talk. So across the United States, these kinds of conduct are criminalized. Now there's an awful lot that one can say about that. Some of them are really vague. Um, they're criminalizing non-serious stuff. You can think of this as the criminalization of poverty. I mean, there's a lot that's going on with respect to these as predicate crimes. You can also note the extent to which this kind of criminalization is not just a form of um, criminal sanction, it's a form of police empowerment. Why? Because if these are the background crimes, it means that when police officers leave the station house, they already have probable cause. They already have probable cause. They already have probable cause. I mean, it's not difficult to have probable cause when those are the predicate crimes. So it's helpful, I think, to think about mass um, criminalization in precisely that way. And if you look at Ferguson, this is the kind of mass criminalization that we saw in that scene. Manner of walking in the road. Ma what's manner of walking? What manner of walking? It's kind of black walking, apparently. But you, you, get, you get the basic idea. So these are the kinds of crimes that make it easy for police officers to effectuate arrest. So let me say something now about um, repeated police interactions and predatory policing. And by predatory policing, I should be clear what I mean. I need the utilization of ordinary policing mechanisms like arrests, like stop and frisk, like warrants, like citations of fines, the utilization of those ordinary features of policing to raise revenue for police departments or cities or to effectuate pay increases, pay increases and salary promotions for police officers. So I want to create the world, the predatory policing world as it functioned in Ferguson as a concrete example of what I mean and then I will stop. So in Ferguson, um, police interactions with African Americans typically took one of three forms. So in one uh, form, uh, the subject would be arrested. That's one direct line to arrest. And I should give away the answer here. 
that all of the lines in my analysis are going to lead to a rest. So I've given you the answer. So when I ask you where does this line lead to, the answer is? Rest. All right, so don't let me take away your A. So all lines lead to a rest, but it could be the case, it could be the case that the officer is engaged in social control policing. You've heard of proactive policing, you've heard of order maintenance policing, you've heard of broken windows policing. So these are all moments in which the officer is not necessarily interested in arresting you at the outset of the interaction. The problem is, if you're subject to that over and over and over again, you're going to push back. You're going to assert rights. And what happens when you do so? Right. And the reason one can say that with some specificity is because across the United States, there is something like a failure to comply charge, something like that just lying in wait for an officer to invoke uh, to justify an arrest against the backdrop of any kind of resistance or just the assertion of rights. So let's move now to the citation of fines. The way it worked in Ferguson is this. You get a fine, and typically you couldn't just pay it. You have to show up in court. So you fail to show up in court, what happens? Arrest. An arrest warrant is issued and you get arrest. Now to give you an empirical indication of just how pervasive this was, um, here are some statistics. So 21,000 residents in Ferguson, okay? Uh, in 2014, 16,000 people had outstanding warrants. You do not look shocked enough. You should look shocked. Now to be fair, not all of those people were residents in Ferguson, but it's still quite stri striking. 2013, 9,000 warrants on 33,000 different offenses. And the reason why you have so many offenses um, can be uh, explained if you think about the <coughs> prosecutor's injunction to police officers. Basically, if you stop someone for W, make sure you give them X, Y, and Z as well. So there's a kind of piling on that explains those particular numbers. At any rate, the broader point is failure to appear leads to arrest. Let's unpack a few more. Um, let's say you appear and you don't have the ability to pay. Often, you would get another fine. And if you can't pay that fine, arrest. you get the idea. But perhaps you don't get a higher fine, but your driver's license uh, is revoked and you're driving without a driver's license, oh, you get the idea, right? So the problem with this as well is that arrest leads to incarceration, and uh, incarceration means that you're spending time in jail with a series of collateral consequences. You're in jail, you can't go to work, you lose your job, you lose your house, it takes you back to the cycle of arrest. So part of what I'm trying to suggest here is that this system of revenue generation interacts with arrest to produce incarceration. And not insignificantly, notice how cash accumulates from the citation to the incarceration. That's a serious accumulation of cash. <coughs> the place I want to end at is this. This system preceded Trump. This structure preceded Trump. Now, am I saying, therefore, that we should not critique Trump and Trumpism? No. Am I saying that there are no exceptional dimensions to Trump and Trumpism? No. What I'm trying to suggest is that ordinary politics that the left, and not just the right, produced has exacted extraordinary violence in the context of the lives of black people. So when we think about contesting Trump and Trumpism, it's important that we keep in mind what panel one uh, suggested that we do. We recognize that there were ordinary politics that helped to produce and that are continuous with the very moment now that we all abhor. Devin just took us to church. Uh, I only kind of mean that in a, as a compliment because when I go to church, when I go to church, and the pastor says, tell your neighbor, I'm like, what if I don't want to tell my neighbor? What if I don't want to say amen? But it's okay, in this case, I did want to repeat, it's structural. Um, so I'm glad you didn't go through with the plan to bring a choir, so. Um, so I think what the, some of the panelists just described is, is the amplification by the Trump administration, or 45, um, of the use of criminalization as a governing strategy, right? Uh, so the use of uh, the language of crime to justify, um, in many ways, 
that are contiguous with the Obama administration to justify its uh, immigration enforcement, the language of crime, particularly using Chicago um, uh, as an example to justify shifts in uh, the or the complete elimination of the reform efforts undertaken under the Obama DOJ, as was explained by Sunita and uh, Lisa. And in the ways that they are now describing attempts to essentially shred what is left of the tattered welfare state by instituting draconian eligibility requirements or uh, asserting the language of fraud to justify shipping boxes of food to SNAP recipients um, in ways that are deeply degrading um, and problematic. Um, so I think this is what we've heard, right? And this was what we heard from, uh, the, from Donald Trump during his inauguration, right? This idea of American carnage, right? Which is represented by um, communities of color, represented by immigrants, as represented by black men and women, as represented by the poor, uh, as represented by communities of color um, that have been devastated by economic marginalization and disinvestment. Um, so I appreciate the way in which this idea of crime as a governing strategy was uh, exemplified by our panelists. One of the questions that I had is, and it really stems from uh, Professor Carbato's uh, comments, is, the, is our focus on litigation and our focus on the federal government. Is it misplaced? Uh, given that most of, uh, most of our, our, our populations that are incarcerated are at the state and local level. So for example, as I speak, uh, we have the largest jail population in the country in LA County with 17,000 people incarcerated at any given moment. The policing strategies that Professor Carbato articulated are designed and implemented at the local level. Um, uh, the issues related to ICE enforcement are in many ways subject to the cooperation of local law enforcement entities. And given the lack of efficacy of uh, civil litigation in transforming or penetrating how um, local and state law enforcement functions, I'm wondering is the focus on the federal government misplaced and is the focus on Lit civil litigation misplaced. So I'm wondering if each of you could respond to that question. So um, I'll start with you, Devin, since you just uh, finished speaking. Um, so I, I would say that uh, no site of possible transformation should be ceded. So I think we do focus too much on litigation, perhaps, and we uh, are certainly perhaps uh, too focused on um, uh, the federal government as well. So I, I would say both of those are probably true, but I resist arguments that suggest that um, we should give up on litigation, that, that, that is to say we can afford not to have that as an arena in which we do politics. And I would also say that we can't give up contesting the federal government as well. So more efforts outside of litigation sounds right to me, and more contestations of local regime sounds right as well. And if we think about different kinds of social change, I mean, the change that we've experienced, for example, around um, LGBT, uh, less the T uh, than the LGB, uh, the change that we've effectuated around that was pretty much um, not top down, was not the federal government, it was, it was bottom up, and it, it was cities passed an ordinance, then the state did something, then a referendum was passed, and then the Supreme Court uh, finally did something right in this particular arena. So I think there's something to your point that local um, initiatives figure um, not as prominently as there might, but that's not an argument to give up on, the, on fighting the federal government, nor is it an argument to see litigation. I would say that right now is a really great time to think about state and local government um, ways to actually shift some of the standards and the laws. I mean, in New York and even in California, there's some really <coughs> interesting experimentation that's happening around those things. Um, in New York, at the time that the Floyd litigation was going on, activists and advocates sort of used the momentum behind the court case as a way to push through lots of local legislation that included um, something, you know, a bill that would require officers to um, sign something around consent to search. That you would not get in litigation. Uh, it, it's not necessarily going to be ordered by a judge, but it's something that, that the local legislature can enact. So there's lots of little ways to experiment and create, like little tiny indentations. I mean, they're not 
going to massively overhaul a system, but it is a way to sort of penetrate something that feels very impenetrable. Um, I'd also say that on the surveillance, um, this came up in the first pa panel, but you know sometimes the community policing efforts that were put into some of these consent decrees really <coughs> look like more community surveillance, right? So a lot of a lot of the the metric in these consent decrees are like police should go to. 20 community meetings every month and the local residents are like well I, black people are like i don't want cops in my meetings what that, that just, that's not what we want we don't want more surveillance of our activity so there are some ways that um things can be put in place on the local level to sort of prevent some of that um, additional scrutiny so i think it's a really now is the time to really be thinking about that um also state courts some state courts have very good are very good to litigate in. So California, New York, New Jersey, some of these other states are really great places to think about filing state class action lawsuits instead of federal ones because the federal bench is just going to get more and more conservative. So there's some some kind of initial thoughts. Yeah, I, I you know I completely agree with what the panelists said, um, and and uh, specifically to follow up on what uh, Professor Patel just said. You know, I do think that this is a great time to look at transforming some of the local politics by using local political campaigns to do that. So for instance, now that the, that the federal government has said, we're not going to do any more police oversight, we don't care about police accountability, well now this is a time to campaign to the state justice department and say, okay, there's a huge shortfall in police oversight federally. Now you have to pick up that shortfall and do more investigations into state, at the state level of, of policing abuses. Um, and you know, this is a great time, for instance, again, for the same reasons, to say to the, to the state justice department, you know, we, ha we have a, a district attorney's office I'm thinking very locally now. We have a district attorney's office in Los Angeles that for 20 years has not brought any of these rogue <coughs> police officers to, to, uh, to justice. They haven't prosecuted any cases against police officers who have shot uh, unarmed black people for the last 20 years, including a very, very egregious case just recently of Brendan Glenn where Jackie Lacey, who heads the, the head, who heads the district attorney's office, said, yeah, I know that there was a video that showed that there was no reason for him to think that Mr. Glenn was going for the gun, but we're still not going to prosecute him because we thought we think that, he, that this police officer was still reasonable in his belief that he was in danger. OK, so we have a 20 years of a district attorney's office that, that has failed to prosecute these shootings. So now, this is a great time to say, we don't have any oversight on the federal level. We don't have any oversight on the local level. State Justice Department, um, which has a very good regime right now, you have to take over. You have to be the one. In, in take over for the district attorney's office. They have no, they have, they're completely biased. Okay, and their 20-year history shows that level of bias. You need to now be prosecuting these cases and investigating cases of um, police abuse in, in, in LA. I just want to say one last thing uh, from, the, from a broader perspective. I don't think that this is the time to abandon uh, federal litigation strategies. I don't think this is the time to say we should just be focusing on what's going on locally and, 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 and not be so distracted what's going on with the federal government. And we've been too distracted with that for too long. No, but what I do think we need to do is to have a, a more broad understanding of civil rights litigation. Because civil if you go back to the, the, the heyday of civil rights, civil rights lit litigation was usually a three-tiered, a two-tiered campaign where you had, you had the litigators who were going into court for race discrimination to, to, to on behalf of people who had been discriminated against, but you also had a local powerful campaign on the streets. The, the Montgomery bu bus boycott is the perfect example. We know more about Rosa Parks than about the, the, the people who were actually plaintiffs in the case that ended uh, discriminatory busing, right? because that was a two-tiered campaign where you had a campaign 
on the streets, the boycotts themselves, and you had a campaign in the courtroom. And we need to marry those two again and make sure that we are working, clo that lawyers, litigators are working closely with community activists so we have this two-tiered approach um, that's going to give us much more traction and make us much more effective. So we have about uh, 25 minutes, uh, so um, I'm happy to take any questions uh, from the audience. Uh, uh, yes. So what I'm hearing, um, and because of the focus in my faith community, can be applied to the homeless as well. And if you're a homeless black person or a homeless person of color, male and female, you're subjected to everything that was in Professor Carvalho's presentation, which I would love to steal from you. <laughs> so, sure. but, uh, it's copyright. I realize it's copyright. So it, it applies, and then there's no one who advocates for these people. So they go to jail, they incur fines. So you were saying it's a cash basis. Where does the money come from if these people are poor, and especially the home? Where is the uh, city government or the police, you know, um, earning money? How, how are they earning money off of this? Okay. Thank you. I'm going to actually take three questions at a time, so that'll be one. Uh, there are there other questions? Uh, yes, sir, with the beanie on. Yes. Uh, I take issue with the premise around, you know, the role of the police and society. I think the premise that you guys argue for is faulty and is wrong. That the police role is not to serve and protect the people. The, so the police role is to serve and protect the system. And this system is, it, it is riddled with inequality, racial, class, sexual. That's the role of the police. That's what they do. That's why there's so many black and brown people. That's why we're still fighting the battle. When I was a youngster, we're still fighting the same battle today. Absolutely, absolutely. Where the police kill and get away with it. Now you've got Trump and this fascist regime, and they bring in all this air asserting white supremacy back with a vengeance. Right, sir, 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 do you have a, do you have a question? Do you have a question? Do you have a question? Yes, that is Okay, thank you. Thank you. We're going to take another question. Uh, yes. Sir, if you want to. I'm going to, I'm going to take your question. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Absolutely, and I'm going to give the panelists an opportunity to respond. Thank you very much. Uh, yes, ma'am. issues of police um, accountability. So in Philadelphia, they just um, voted in a so-called progressive DA, Krasner, Larry Krasner. And in speaking with some of the attorneys who were part of that campaign, they've been talking to me about how he came in and immediately he started making different policy changes. So my question is, as we try to address, because it is reformative, I'm not going to pretend that it's not, as we try to crack into this inability to hold the police accountable, can you talk a little bit more about specifically, one, what is the institutional context in which the DA operates? In other words, um, her inability, um, Jackie Lacey's inability to operate in the same way in which a white male can operate in that context, right? Even if she wanted to make changes, what can the community do? Where are the cleavages institutionally such that the community can make interventions, right? Um, and, and what would that actually look like? Um, that's what I'm interested in. How we, 
Thank you very much for all three of your comments and questions. So the first question uh, was about the policing of homeless communities, particularly in, in Los Angeles, and the way in which this exemplifies the sort of the exemplifies of predatory policing that Professor Carbato uh, discussed during his remarks. The second question had to do with the basic premise of, uh, of often how we approach policing, that policing is intended to protect and serve communities when in fact, um, perhaps we ought to be conceptualizing police as um, facilitating the protection of the status quo, for facilitating the protection of power, facilitating the protection of violent institutions in our society. So um, the invitation is for a comment from the, the panelists. And the last question I think invites us to consider the question of what do we mean by reform? Uh, particularly when it comes to district attorneys. Um, so one, I think we, the panelists, to the extent that you're interested in picking this up, is about how do we understand reform as re there's non-reformist reform, which in, in effect stabilizes and legitimizes contemporary policing practices, and then there's reform that actually can shrink and minimize and constrain state power as it's uh, exemplified through its punitive carceral apparatuses. So I'm wondering if you all can take on those questions, and, and in particular the question about um, the district attorney. This has been a strategy that activists have used across the country in Philadelphia, Chicago, and elsewhere to try to challenge incumbent district attorneys that have not been aggressive enough in challenging um, police corruption. Um, and the question is, what, what activists have come to find is that there are institutional constraints, even on prosecutors that are wearing this sort of progressive mantle in terms of what they can do to transform uh, law enforcement and legal prosecutions in their jurisdiction. So if you all want to pick up any one um, uh, or all of those threads in your responses, that would be appreciated. So Devin, maybe we can start with you. I guess I'll just say a couple of quick things. One, um, the point about homelessness, uh, 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 people being particularly vulnerable is just true. Uh, with respect to revenue generation capacity, um, you know, someone gets a ticket for fifty dollars. Um, they pay it, or it turns out they paid it late. They get another twenty-five dollar ticket. I mean, it, it ratchets it up. So you'll be surprised the extent to which people have no means are precisely the people who are economically exploited in ways that build up huge revenues. That was absolutely the case in Ferguson, uh, Missouri, where a person who initially got a ticket, I'm not gonna get the math right, but it was a relatively low amount, ended up thousands of dollars in debt, uh, even though that person had paid, let's say, $500. So multiply that across 25,000, you know, you, you get a sense of how quickly we can ratchet up the debt. On the point about, um, I think one of the things that, uh, we don't do carefully with respect to articulating a progressive position is to think about um, different sites of contradictions. So the policing, for example, is one site of contradiction. We could just say, hey, why are we here? Why are we here um, against the backdrop of a particular kind of American democracy? If we think about the history of American democracy or American constitution, why do we go to court? It's, it's that system that reproduced a set of violence that resulted in 60s uh, re revolutionary politics, for example. So I think it's fair to invoke the police and ask, well, um, they're not really there, and why do we think that they um, have the capacity to do X, Y, and Z? I would ask us to ask ourselves questions more fundamentally about the system, American democracy, and the like which people sometimes freely trade on every day. They invoke this or that right to speak, the right to protest, when that's trading on the very thing that has done violence in the past. So I don't see the police as somehow um, uniquely situated vis-a-vis -vis sites of contradiction. I think we have to ask that question, and it's a hard question, across all features of American life. And I don't know that we do that with enough vigor or consistency. Um, Lisa, perhaps you can talk about, so, so when you were concluding your remarks, you were discussing sort of the role of prosecutors, particularly Jas Jackie Lacey. So I'm wondering if you could take up the question about reform and the role of prosecutors in facilitating reform, and how should we even think about reform? Okay, well, I, I, I will sort of give you the disclaimer that, you know, I started out my career as a public defender, and like most public defenders, you never trust a prosecutor. <laughs> um, so, uh, you know, I hear the term progressive prosecutor, and to me, that's just a com complete oxymoron. I've never met one. 
So I, I think that the, the main constraint that you're dealing with when you're talking about a prosecutor's office and a prosecutor regardless of their race, um, a prosecutor regardless of their location geographically, is that they're a prosecutor and they're coming from a prosecutor's perspective, okay, which is an extremely conservative perspective and it's not a system, they, they don't do a systemic analysis. They think, they think people of, of people as, as individuals who don't accept responsibility um, <laughs> and, and they commit wrongs, but they don't think about, they don't do a historical ana analysis, they don't do a racial analysis, they don't do a systemic analysis to see how people are put into positions where they are constantly being criminalized. Um, and they, they and, 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 and analogous to that, they, prosecutors, are ve have a very, very close relationship to the police, and they often believe that the police can do no wrong, okay? They, they really, most of them truly believe that the police are there, to, they're doing a very hard job, they're doing the best that they can, you know, um, and they're dealing with very, very difficult residents, and so, you know, almost anything that they do, almost any fear that they have is reasonable. And therefore, this concept, this legal concept of not really prosecuting a, a police officer unless their conduct is unreasonable is not a, a, a concept that prosecutors buy into because there's no such thing as unreasonable, unreasonable <coughs> police conduct for a prosecutor. So that's the constraint. I, th I think we're dealing with a, a constraint in the prosecutor's perspective and their conception and their fundamental world view. Um, so, so, you know, unless, unless if, if, there is, if there is a prosecutor that does seem uh, less conservative, that does seem more willing to, um, to, you know, to, to do a systemic analysis, then that's wonderful, and then locally you should do whatever you can to make sure that you push that prosecutor to um, to, to 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 move to move the civil rights uh, to move us forward. Um, you know, which is why I say in in the position that we're in right now, we have a state justice department that seems to have a, to 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 have a slightly more progressive bent and seems to be more willing to do the right thing. And so if there is, we should be campaigning locally to get the state justice department to intervene now since we're seeing that our local district attorney is not going to prosecute the police. So that's where I think our efforts should lie in, in campaigning the, the, the state justice department to, to move on these cases um, and, 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 and um, you know, fill the gaps where the, where the federal government and the local, and the local uh, municipality um, have left have have left us vulnerable. I and I do want to just say something to address uh, you know the question about our, our, how our whole perspective is messed up because police exist <laughs> simply to um, terrorize us um, and, and I think and and I, I think that's completely a valid perspective, especially when you look at at what's going, at, 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 when you do a historical analysis, the police um, sort of came to be institutionalized right after slavery, right after slavery ended. That's when the, the police as an institution came, really came into being. And it was because of the 13th Amendment and because there were these newly freed people and those people needed to be constrained, they needed to be policed. And so that's why that institution was created. And that is their raison d'etre, right? That's their reason for being. So we can't expect that to change even 150 years later. So I think your perspective is, is, is spot on. And we always have to bring that historical analysis into our, our, our approach. I'd just say I agree that the history behind policing is a mechanism of social control. So I think we can just that's just a baseline. Um, I just wanted to mention on the homelessness issue, I'm also the 
the faculty director of the UCLA Veterans Legal Clinic, and so we deal, well, many of our clients are homeless and are dealing with fines and fees issues um, and ticketing issues. And so we've actually gone into court to try to help um, our clients uh, have their, um, their tickets expunged or reduce their fines. Um, and so there are some legal mechanisms to do that. They're absolutely inadequate. And in some cities around the country, there's actually measures to try to completely expunge all fines for people of you know certain categories of certain types of crimes. I think that's, that's a really important um, thing to think about and to consider. Um, and, you know, on the issue of um, the historical role of civil disobedience or people put, what kind of risks people were willing to take. I think that we're in that era again. What kind of, what kind of risks are we all willing to take? What kind of risks, who are we gonna stand with? And I think for all the law students in the room, I think it's really important wherever you end up to know how to get people out of jail. Um, that is like, for me, wherever I've lived, it's been like the sort of the midnight call, like can you come down and get this person out of jail? They're not supposed to be there. This person, you know, there was a rally, something happened. Like that is a, sort of an essential function of a social justice lawyer. So just. Okay, additional questions. So we'll go one, uh, two, and then <coughs> three. So yes, in the red glasses. Well, this, um, question slash comment is for Professor Holder. So I want to push back a little bit about your observation about prosecutors, because I do think there is a crop of prosecutors right now who are interested in reform, who are, many of them are former public defenders, right? And I think the question about how does the community support those prosecutors for working within an institution that's been designed just to criminalize people is a valid question, right? So you see the situation with Arana Ayala Florida, who adopts the policy to eliminate the death penalty, and she received extreme political flack because of that. She has been disempowered because of that, you know? And you see, in Chicago, Kim Fox has been able to do some stuff in terms of changing bail reform, but these prosecutors are also vulnerable, right? They're changing the institution, they need to reform the prosecutor's office, get rid of people who've been there for a long time, and so how does the community intervene, how can the community support them when they're taking these political risks, asking for money to you know, support alternatives to incarceration and the like. Because there are many, many people who've been inspired over the last few years to become prosecutors, but they want to change things. And I think we need to seriously ask, how do we support them? Thank you. Uh, yes. Oh, so I'm going to take well, three, three questions oh, okay. and, then, and then we'll have responses. Yes. Um, so, um, you know, Corporations in this country have very powerful civil rights, and they keep winning more and more civil rights and protections. And when we think of criminal justice, we think about the role of the state and local actors in the federal government. When corporations are very just profit directly from you know building, uh, you know running prisons, um, <coughs> you know like bidding on the contracts for the border wall to build the wall, um, manufacturing surveillance. That, you know, like bracelets, everything. How can, I was just curious if you could reflect on just thinking, and corporations of course are think, thought of it being in the private, you know, the private sphere that's beyond regulation and oversight. So I was just wondering how we can like update and revise how we think about just civil rights activism and civil rights jurisprudence and litigation and thinking to, to think about incorporate just corporations and capitalism and just the role uh, and then the last question. We've been teaching our high school students in civics classes that the Fourth Amendment is a good thing, and uh, <laughs> what should we be teaching? <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> How long do you have? <laughs> I think that's an invitation. Um, okay, so we have three questions on the table. Um, one has to do with, with a question for uh, Professor Holder about sort of how do you support prosecutors who are actually doing the tough work of trying to transform institutions so that they are not focused on arrests, prosecution, criminalization. Um, so the question is, do you see those folks as reformers? And to the extent that you do, how, how do we support them? The second question has to do with how do we 
expand our thinking about civil rights litigation uh, in, the, in the context of, the, of, of criminal justice beyond form, the formal sort of silos around policing, prosecutors, prisons, to include the way in which corporations participate in criminalization, how can we include them in some of our tactics and strategies? And then the last question is, is the Fourth Amendment a good thing? <laughs> I think all of us would agree, yes, in theory. Okay, so um, uh, Lisa, the first question was posed directly to you. Uh, well, you know, I expected pushback because I, you know, I, I, I have a very absolutist uh, uh, position about prosecutors and that was very much tainted my, by my experience for my first seven years as a lawyer as a, as a, as a public defender. So I'm not, I'm not the best person, uh, I'll be honest, I'm not the best person to ask about reformist prosecutors because I've never met one and I'm very skeptical about their, their, their existence. But, you know, theoretically, um, if, <laughs> clearly if there is someone who truly believes in reform and managed to keep that reformist perspective within that institution, um, for, for decades if they made it to the point where they are the district attorney. Well, if that person exists and, 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 and really is, is, is looking to make systemic change, then of course the community should find ways to support them and you know, in very sort of conventional ways just be very vocal about the fact that we like what this prosecutor's doing, okay? They're changing the system in a way that's going to make it more equitable. And so, you know, I think you rally people locally to support that voice and to support that individual um, that's, that's on the margins of the, of the prosecutor's office. Um, um, so that, that, that would be my response. Uh, and just a, a quick response regarding the Fourth Amendment. <laughs> you know, I, of course, the Fourth Amendment is a good thing. The, the way the Fourth Amendment has been interpreted by these courts and the way that the Fourth Amendment has been gutted over the last 25 years is a bad thing. But the Fourth Amendment as a concept itself is a good thing. Um, and one of the, the, in terms of the interpretation, I think one of the, 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 the best things that, one of the most important things that we need to start thinking about is this notion of stopping, the, of a Terry stop and its validity. Um, you know, and a, ter a Terry stop is one of the linchpins, you know, in, in terms of the way the Fourth Amendment is effectuated, where if a, pol a police officer has reasonable suspicion, they can stop someone just to investigate whether a crime is afoot. Well, in theory, that's fine, but in practice and in the context of, a, of an extremely racist society, it is highly problemat problemat problematic that reasonable suspicion, such an amorphous, uh, concept is the basis for making a first contact with an individual, okay? So that, that is where we need to begin. I think we need to get rid of that benchmark of reasonable suspicion. It's not enough. I don't think that you should be able to approach someone to investigate if, if, if a crime is afoot simply based on reasonable suspicion. It needs to be a higher uh, benchmark somewhere between reasonable suspicion and probable cause because it is that first initial contact that is being abused and that is far too discretionary and that is bringing um, black and brown people into the criminal justice system. Um, so we had two other questions on the table, uh, one having to do with uh, corporations and their participation in the expansion of uh, punitive state. So are there any comments? Just, I can say something quickly on that. Because I, 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 I have been involved with litigation that included corporate defendants, private prisons, um, and also uh, in the post 9-11 context around private corporations that were involved with the war on terror. And I'll just say that um, the landscape is extremely bleak on that, on that front. Um, there are, um, between immunity and also sort of the um, doctrines that allow these corporations to uh, to, to be viewed in a way that they get the, fed, the federal, the governmental kind of cloak, and then also, but then at the same time benefit from the fact that they are a corporation, and so therefore they are not subject to the same transparency um, laws that are in effect. It's, I, I, I just think it's very bleak. We need to keep, continue to try, um, but just in the last year or two, there have been 
I, I, I hate to be so negative, but it's 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 very difficult road to road to plow. Um, and I wanted to just point out a macro issue around strategies that we haven't mentioned, which is funding and resources. So one of the reasons why so many people, you know, focus on civil rights lit litigation or litigation as a tool is that foundations and private donors give organizations funding to bring those lawsuits. That is sort of a driving force of a lot of what we're talking about. There have been large grants given to city, given to organizations to run these DA campaigns, but then there's no funding to enforce, to make sure that you hold those DAs accountable in, or, or promote or certain other policies. Um, and I think that it's really important to think about where, you know, as individuals, we're putting our resources and donating money, but also where what we're doing to take away the funding structure that is required to sort of push forward some of these um, broader advocacy efforts. Okay, so uh, uh, Sunidi, you will have the last word here. Um, as we're at 12.46 and we're out of time, uh, apologies for those of you who had questions that we weren't able to get to. Um, just on a point of personal privilege, uh, I was a student here um, some odd years ago uh, when we, uh, yes, yes for me being a student, yes for me graduating. Uh, <laughs> Uh, and she was a difficult student to I was, I was. Um, and uh, I was here when we celebrated the 35th anniversary of the National Black Law Journal. So it's uh, really heartening to see that you have that you're facilitating uh, incredibly important and timely conversations uh, that affect black communities across the country and communities of color more generally. Um, and I wanna thank this panel for all of their insight and wisdom and helping us to understand the current moment. So please give them a round of applause.